Order, please. <laughs> we'll now begin with the daily routine, beginning with presenting and reading of petitions, presenting reports of committees, tabling reports, regulations, and other papers. Statements by ministers. Government notices of motion. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, may I make an introduction? Permission granted. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, may I draw your attention to the uh, East Gallery? I'd like to uh, introduce two special guests. Uh, Fallon Jones, uh, and, and if you can uh, rise uh, when I acknowledge you, uh, Fallon Jones, uh, Events and Development Coordinator for the Atlantic Region for Prostate Cancer Canada, and uh, Dennis uh, <coughs> Potherist, uh, Executive Director for the Atlantic Region for Prostate Cancer Canada. Uh, that's the uh, house give a warm welcome uh, to these two uh, special guests. The Honourable Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas prostate cancer is the most common cancer among Canadian men, and whereas one in seven Canadian men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer in their lifetime, and whereas there continues to be a tremendous need for greater awareness and education about prostate cancer, therefore be it resolved that all members of this legislature recognize September as National Prostate Cancer Awareness <laughs> Month. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There is a request for waiver. Is it agreed? <clears throat> it is agreed, but all those in favour of the motion, please say aye. Contrary-minded, nay. The motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of Immigration. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Whereas on September 22nd, Nova Scotians will welcome his Beatitude, Cardinal Marp Shara Butra Sarai, Maronite Patriarch of Antioch and all of the East, as part of his pastoral visit to Canada. And whereas the Maronite community in Nova Scotia is very grateful to have Cardinal Rai in Halifax to concentrate the new site of Our Lady of Lebanon Church and the community centre, followed by a solemn mass and dinner banquet. And whereas the visit of Patriarch Rai to Nova Scotia is great proof of dedication, leadership and commitment, to communities all around the world and that from the beginning of the community in Canada in the early 19th century, it has integrated and contributed to the great diversity that Canada is built upon. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of this House wish his beatitude many years of peace and happiness as he continues tirelessly to bring the faithful together and shape the life of the Church and congratulate all those organizing the event. Mr. Speaker, I ask for waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. Motion is carried. <laughs> the Honourable Minister of Communities, Culture and Heritage. I give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas Nova Scotian country music artists Aaron C. Lewis from Sydney, Matt Balser from Hansport, and Bill Guest from Dartmouth were the 2018 inductees into the Nova Scotia Country Music Hall of Fame, and whereas the Nova Scotia Country Music Hall of Fame is committed to the preservation, promotion, and development of country music in Nova Scotia and continues to recognize the deserving artists who have made a significant impact to our province's country music industry. Whereas the music and songs of Mr. Lewis, Mr. Balser, and Mr. Guest are keeping our, our province's country music traditions alive and well, ensuring our country music culture and heritage will continue to live on for generations. Therefore, be it resolved that members of the House of Assembly join me in congratulating this year's inductees and thank them for sharing their extraordinary talents with all of us, and that we also acknowledge and thank the current president of the Nova Scotia Country Music Hall of Fame, Mr. Roger Bleasdale, for his leadership, past president, Mr. Floyd Spicer for his service and past leadership in ensuring Nova Scotia's country music <clears throat> talent is honoured and preserved for generations to come. Mr. Speaker, I ask for a waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary-minded, nay. The motion is carried. We'll now move on to introduction of bills. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg leave to introduce the bill entitled An Act Respecting Property Tax Rebates to Senior Citizens. Here, here. 
the Honourable Minister of Service, Nova Scotia. begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act Respecting Property Tax Rebate to Senior Citizens. Bill number 45 entitled An Act Respecting Property Tax Rebates to Senior Citizens. Ordered that the bill be read a second time on a future day. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 246 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Labour Standards Code, Respecting Sick Leave. The, Hon the Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 246 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Labour Standards Code Respecting Sick Leave. Bill number 46 entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 246 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Labour Standards Code Respecting Sick Leave. Ordered that the bill be read a second time on a future day. The Honourable Member for Coal Harbour, Eastern Passage. I beg leave to make an introduction. Permission granted. I would like to draw all of the members to the West Gallery, where to the right in the front row is my constituency assistant, Lisa Roshan. And uh, to her left is Master Corporal Ginny Eisen from Eastern Passage, who upon uh, having her journey with uh, cancer turned around and has already done two uh, cancer uh, fundraisers and has raised almost $20,000 on behalf of those with cancer. The Honourable Member for Coal Harbour Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today, I beg leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Establish Cancer Survivors Day. <clears throat> the Honourable Member for Coal Harbour Eastern Passage begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Establish Cancer Survivors Day. Bill number 47 entitled An Act to Establish Cancer Survivors Day. Ordered that the bill be read a second time on a future day. The Honourable Minister of Service, Nova Scotia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Various Statutes, Statutes Administered by Service Nova Scotia. The Honourable Minister of Service Nova Scotia begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Various Statutes Administered by Service Nova Scotia. Bill number 48, entitled An Act to Amend Various Statutes Administered by Service Nova Scotia. Ordered that the bill be read a second time on a future day. We'll now move on to notices of motion. Statements by members. The Honourable Member for Pictou West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to acknowledge the fourth annual Pictou County edition of the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation Ride for a Cure. The ride took place at the Dacos Performing Arts Centre in Pictou. The JDRF is the world leader in researching type 1 diabetes, and their work has been critical to understanding more about the disease and someday finding a cure. This event included motorcycle and bicycle riders who gathered to show their support. There were prizes offered to the top three pledge collectors as well as a barbecue. I would like to thank the dedicated and kind organizer, Leah Sutherland, and the participants who came together to make this a successful event for all. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Anaganish. Seven years ago, the Monsignor Hugh McPherson Council 14596 Knights of Columbus launched their annual toy drive. Since then, they have assisted close to 2,000 families and over 2,100 children, all while providing about over 8,300 volunteer hours. 
The toy drive, which starts mid-November and wraps up on Christmas Eve, has become an essential resource for many in the community. Its positive impact on local families during what can be a very stressful time of year has earned them a special honour. In acknowledgement of the tremendous success of its annual toy drive, the group based out of St Andrews earned a third place honour in the Knights of Columbus International Service Award in the Family Service category. To put it in context, Mr. Speaker, there are more than 15,000 councils worldwide, so this recognition is significant and well earned. Mr. Speaker, I ask my fellow members of the House of Assembly to join me in congratulating the Knights of Columbus for their tireless efforts to assist families in their need during the holidays. The dedication of its volunteers at this busy time does not go unnoticed. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased today to recognize Sonia Minosha. She of the Amherst Recreation Department. This summer, Sonia went into local workplaces and businesses and encouraged workers to participate in a fitness break. She encouraged workers who are busy to remember that their health and wellness is an important part of their lives. Sonia showed great leadership involving our workers to take a few minutes to consider their health and fitness, and it's something we should all remember to do. Mr. Speaker, I ask all members to join me in thanking Sonia for her leadership in promoting healthy workplaces. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize a group of family and volunteers who hosted a golf tournament on August 3rd in memory of my deceased uncle, Mike Kennedy, at the Lingan Golf and Country Club. With more than 20 teams played on one of the hottest days of the year, it was a complete success. From the countless donations of prizes from area businesses, volunteers, lots of fun and laughter, we all came together to give back to the community in his memory, just as he gave back during his life. After a good meal, prizes for all, we were able to, to raise almost $5,000, donating, donating half to special, special Olympics and half to the Cape Breton Cancer Center. And in true Mike spirit, the one trophy that was given was for most sportsmanlike, as this was more important to him than winning. The Honourable Member for Preston Dartmouth. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I would like to recognize Ms. Melanie Noggle who has changed her mail delivery routes and assignment on July 13, 2018 as a dedicated mail carrier for the Mineville area. She has faithfully delivered the mail to the community for the past 20 years. She went ab above and beyond the call of duty in delivering parcels and letters to residents' homes, always with a smile on her face and a pleasant greeting. The selfish act eliminated trips to the Coal Harbor Post Office for packages. The residents present her with a card, a monetary donation, and flowers at a community get-together. I applaud and congratulate Ms. Melanie Noggle on her exemplary service to the residents of Mineville and doing such in a such pleasant and efficient manner. The Honourable Member from Cape Breton, Richmond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well done. Order. Order. <laughs> The, 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 the Honourable Member for uh, Cape Breton, Richmond. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to make an introduction. Mr. Speaker, in the West Gallery today, I have the pleasure of introducing to this house my son, Garrett Patrick Pond, who is here with us today. He's just come back from the Toronto International Film Festival after having a successful pitch for the, I think, Telefilm Canada, and he's going to be uh, coming back home. We won one back, Mr. Speaker. Uh, he's coming back home to work on a film here in Nova Scotia. So welcome home, Garrett. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to be the voice of the now silent, the voice of the palliative care patients who are undervalued by our health care system. Every life should be valued, treated with respect, and provided with access to programs and services that help to improve quality of life. It is now up to members of this legislature to be the voice of the vulnerable sector of our population, those who require palliative care services. This pe these people lived, they worked, and they invested in their families and our Nova Scotia economy. Their lives mattered. These same people needed our help when it was most urgent, urgent and we failed them. Mr. Speaker, these people no longer can speak for themselves, and I feel compelled, and I hope the members also feel compelled, to act on their behalf and on behalf of anyone who finds themselves in the position of not receiving adequate support in the final days of their lives. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Uh, Aubrey, I will remind the members that you are not to uh, uh, speak on bills or debate bills that are before the House. The Honourable Member from Dartmouth North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to take a moment to recognize the work of an important organization in Nova Scotia. Community Agenda for Social Assistance, Adequacy and Reform is a group of individuals and organizations that believe that true social assistance reform can happen in Nova Scotia. KSAR uh, asserts that we need a social assistance program that has at its foundation four essential principles. Human rights, that is creating policy that's inclusive of human rights and which reflects the social determinants of health. Adequacy, where everyone has the right to an adequate standard of living. Collaboration, where government works in true collaboration with recipients of social assistance and their allies to develop new policies and legislation. And trust, where our social assistance program is based on a culture of trust and problem solving. Currently, Mr. Speaker, our community services programs seem to be based on mistrust and punitive measures. Currently, many people on social assistance find it difficult to live dignified lives, and currently, many people are frustrated and feel unheard. I applaud the work of KSAR, and I wish to give voice to its agenda in this House today. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Claire Digby. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and welcome to your new position in the Legislature. Mr. Speaker, I'm often so proud of my community, the place where I grew up and which I now represent. I live in a place where we care about our neighbours and show up when a neighbour needs our help. Often this is to someone diagnosed with cancer or some other serious illness. This diagnosis has an obvious impact on the patient and his friends and family, but can also have a devastating impact on the family's finances as the patient is treated and recuperates. Recently, Dean D'Ambrose was diagnosed with esophagus cancer in which he needed to be treated in Halifax. Unable to work, family and friends wanted to help and organize a benefit hosted at the Digby Fire Department. The afternoon included a silent auction and a bake sale in addition to a raffle. In that afternoon, the organizers raised slightly more than $20,000 for Dean. This will allow him to focus on his health and not have to worry about his finances for now. I want to congratulate the organizers and thank the people who dropped in to buy a ticket, listen to music and help a neighbour. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to recognize Mamie Johnson, who has been volunteering at the Cape Breton Farmers Exhibition in North Sydney for the past 58 years. This year marked the exhibition's 102nd anniversary, and over the many years she has been involved, Mamie has witnessed numerous changes. This 84 years young lady plans to take an active role in this exhibition for many years to come. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Mamie for her years of service to the Farmers Exhibition and to the Northside community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Mr. Speaker, may I please make an introduction? May I, may I make an introduction? You may. Thank you. Uh, if I can draw the House's attention to the West Gallery, we're joined today by my mother-in-law, Olga Leitau. Uh, when we realized, looking ahead at the calendar, that my partner was going to be traveling for possibly two weeks of this setting of the legislature, we begged her to come, <laughs> and she has, and therefore I am eating well, my children are happy, and I'm very, I'm very, very grateful that she has joined us from Montreal. Um, Olga uh, came to Canada as an immigrant in 1972, lucky for Nova Scotia, now two of her three children live in Halifax, and I am ever grateful for that as well. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Guysborough Eastern Shore Trackity. Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> this past weekend, a greater area of Guysborough was happily overrun with nearly 500 excited cyclists participating in the annual Lost Shores Grand Fondo event. There are over 100 community volunteers that help with this registration, road safety, and billeting for this widely popular event. Today, I rise in recognition of one of those essential volunteers. For the past three years, Karen DeLore has volunteered at the water station in the lovely Acadian community of Larry's River, where she provides a great hospitality to each cyclist with her warm smile and pleasant words of encouragement. Her thoughtful efforts and positive attitude are greatly appreciated by the hundreds of thirsty participants and event organizers alike. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank Karen DeLore for being a fine example 
of the power of community-minded action, and I would also like to commend the Lost Shores Grand Fondo organizers, volunteers, cyclists, and sponsors for another very successful event. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Queen's Shelburne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to congratulate four young ladies from Queen's County whose musical passion that started off as something to pass the time has taken off in a big way. Grace Curry, Ava Smith, Zoe Monroe, and Ruthie Hartland are better known as the Four Strings and have wowed audiences throughout Queen Shelburne with their ukulele playing this year. With appearances including the Queen's County Music Festival, the Nova Scotia Teachers Union Dinner, having a float and the Privateer Days Parade, these self-taught grade 7 students have taken the humble ukulele to a whole new dimension. Congratulations on your accomplishments so far and we look forward to seeing where this goes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. No. The Honourable Member for Halifax Armdale. Mr. Speaker, the Halifax Nordic Ski Club, through the work of Armdale's Lorenzo Caterini, is moving forward with the construction of a 600-meter ski loop at Brunello Estates. The ski facility will be open to everyone and should be equipped to allow users of all levels of mobility to partake in the fun. With the Brunello Estates Golf Course partnering with the club to make the project a reality, the loop will offer a safe and scenic opportunity for winter fun and will be an excellent place for kids to learn to ski through the ski club's seasonal programming. I want to thank Lorenzo, the Halifax Nordic Ski Club and the team at Brunello Estates for working to expand winter recreation opportunities in our city. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Sydney River, Myra Lewisburg. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and Mr. Speaker, welcome to the Chair. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to congratulate the Coxteeth Hills Wilderness Association. The group took part in the recent Hike Nova Scotia Summit. The Coxteeth Group was presented with the Summit Award for Outstanding Leadership and Commitment to the Growth and Development of Hiking in Nova Scotia. The Coxeath Hills Wilderness Recreation Association was formed in 2002 by volunteers dedicated to protecting the Coxeath Hills located in Blackett's Lake near Sydney. The hills also are known as Coxeath Mountain and they include 10 kilometers of trails that provide panoramic views of the surrounding areas as well as a hilltop cottage called Pittman Lodge. I am pleased to take this opportunity to thank the Coxeath Hills Wilderness Association and the many volunteers who work so tirelessly to maintain this wonderful area and to congratulate them on winning this award. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and welcome to the Chair. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize Celtic Colours. It's an upcoming Upcoming Celtic Colours Festival on Cape Breton Island is an experience like no other. For nine days in October, Cape Breton Island is alive with music, energy and excitement as people from far and wide come to celebrate our rich culture. From concerts to dances and workshops to community suppers, we offer a full range of events against a gorgeous backdrop of autumn colours. 49 concerts island-wide, 300 community experiences and nine unforgettable days and nights. I'm thankful to be invited to the gala opening, which is a remarkable event in and of itself. I urge my colleagues to take in any performances for this fabulous festival that it provides and enjoy. Kiad Milfelcha. The Honourable Member for Coal Harbour, Portland Valley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to acknowledge two very hardworking, bright students who, in my mind, are future leaders for our community and possibly the province, Jordan and Caleb Ortiz. Jordan and Caleb are dedicated par participants in the Duke of Edinburgh's International Award Nova Scotia program. These two outgoing young people are part of Coal Harbour Portland Valley's Duke Group, which is mentored by, my, by our constituency office team. Jordan and Caleb have received the Bronze Award and now are receiving the Silver Award. On behalf of the Coal Harbour Portland Valley community and myself, I would like to say congratulations to these well-deserving students. Well done. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Mr. Speaker, and welcome to the Chair. Monsieur le Président, je me lève aujourd'hui 
pour reconnaître Lucette Doucette, une enseignante à l'école Boisjoli. Comme enseignante de maternelle, Madame Doucette est une des premières enseignantes pour accueillir les élèves à l'école lorsqu'ils commencent leur trajet d'éducation. Madame Doucette est une enseignante qui met les besoins de ses étudiants par dessus tout et s'assure que leurs besoins sont satisfaits. Sont, sont satisfaits. Elle s'inquiète sincèrement de chaque enfant et veut les voir attendre des succès. Madame Doucette aperçoit lorsque ses élèves essayent de leur mieux et les encourage dans leur moment faible. Elle encourage l'apprentissage de manière amusante pour ses élèves. rejoins moi pour remercier Madame Doucette pour encourager un amour d'apprentissage et d'éducation dans ces jeunes élèves. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Timberley Prospect. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to recognize Jenny Benson of Timberley. Jenny initiated a project that provides financial support to enable 20 girls in Uganda, Uganda to attend school and receive an education. Jenny's interest in helping girls in Africa receive an education came from her own first-hand experience of meeting a young woman from Africa participating in the International AIDS Conference. Their deep friendship led Jenny to help change the lives of vulnerable girls living in high-conflict areas of the world. I would like the members of the Nova Scotia House of Assembly to join me in thanking Jenny for her community work, which has made a significant difference in changing the lives of women. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Picto Centre. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Vernon Terrio began working at the West Ray Mine six months before the devastating explosion that occurred on May 9, 1992. The incident took the lives of 26 men, 15 who were recovered, 11 employees who were left forever underground somewhere below the Parkdale Memorial Monument. Vernon has authored a book, West Ray, My Journey from Darkness to Light. It is an account of his experiences working at the coal mine in Pictou County. He joined the Drager men who courageously tried to rescue the miners, but as days passed by, hope vanished. Terrio, along with numerous others, would re later receive a Medal of Bravery for their efforts in trying to rescue the trapped miners. I'd like to extend my congratulations to Vernon for writing this book and honoring his fellow workers and memories of that dreadful day in the history of mining in Pictou County. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Fairview Clayton Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and welcome to the Chair. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize Fairview resident Bill Billard on his 95th birthday, celebrated this past June at the Fairview Legion. Bill served as president of Fairview Branch 142 and is looked at fondly by his friends and family. Many people were in attendance, including fellow Legion members, close friends and family. They, the gathering included food, pu punch, a little bit of punch, and many laughs that were shared by all in attendance. Bill is loved by everyone at the Fairview branch, not only for the hours and dedication he put in during his time as president, but for his kind, generous, and fun-loving spirit. Without his hard work, the organization would not have been as successful as it is today. Mr. Speaker, I ask the members of this House of Assembly join me in celebrating Bill Billard on his 95th birthday. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Bulladry's Joella Falls is well, a well-known figure in Cape Breton and beyond. Joella has co-hosted CBC Cape Breton's Information Morning. She co-founded the Celtic Colors International Festival, where she also served as artistic director for 20 years and directs the Bulladry Lakeview Choir and much more. In 2012, she received the Order of Canada for her incredible commitment to her community. Now retired, Joella is pursuing her music and songwriting and recently released her new CD, Looking Back, a collection of songs that reflect the stories of her life. On August 10th, she celebrated the release of her CD at Rita's Tea Room in Big Pot. I ask all members of the legislature to join me in thanking Joella Foles for her many contributions to the Cape Breton community in so many ways and wish her all the best in her retirement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Mr. Speaker, 
During recent uh, lengthy conversations about education that have happened in Nova Scotia, both in this house and outside of it, um, often there has been reference to Finland and to the success of the Finnish school system. It, it achieves great results and teachers working in that system are held in very high esteem. So I wanted to share something that I learned uh, recently about that school system from reading a great nonfiction book called The Nordic Theory of Everything by Anu Partinen. On education, Ms. Partinen explains how Finland reformed their education system at a time that it was not achieving great results. And she's clear that the goal of education reform was to promote equity. It was to make sure that all students had every opportunity to learn, to realize their potential, and to have the so social supports they required, and food, and uh, recreational and artistic opportunities. The goal of the Finnish school system was and is equity. And a result, almost a side effect of that equity, was that the students' results began improving. So equity begets excellence. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Waverly Fall River Be Beaverbank. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Fall River resident Meredith Faulkner received her commissioning scroll on May 14, 2018. The commissioning scroll is a personal link to the sovereign and a tangible symbol of the trust of the Crown places in the recipient. Meredith was honoured to receive her scroll from Lieutenant Colonel Russell Hubley, a decorated Second World War veteran. Meredith is a member of the Halifax Rifles Army Cadet and is a graduate of Lockview High School. Mr. Speaker, I, I uh, ask all members of the host to uh, congratulate Meredith on her receiving the Commissioner's Scroll. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Coal Harbour Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today I rise to acknowledge Ben Broom for the hard work he and his team of volunteers did this summer to establish Nova Scotia's first Metro Annual National Peacekeeping Ceremony on August 9th. Ben worked with Veterans UN NATO Canada as a provincial representative. In communities across Canada, there are cenotaphs and monuments to remember the sacrifices made by the men and women who have served as our peacekeepers. It was my honour to speak at the Dartmouth ceremony this summer. It was made all the more special because my son, Corporal John Lavoie, was leaving the very next week to go on his first four-month peacekeeping mission in Kuwait. I ask all members of the Legislature to join me in thanking the members of the Canadian Armed Forces, Police, Fire and all other peacekeeping first responders for their courage and sacrifice. The Honourable Member for Hammonds Plains, Lucasville. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to congratulate Sir John A. Macdonald High on the completion of their Skilled Trade Centre. Students will now have the opportunity for voc vocational training that will promote skills development that may point them in a direction to explore career, to career options in the trades. Six different courses will be offered this school year, designed by high school teachers, Nova Scotia Community College and industry representatives. Students will have a mixture of theory and practical hands-on activities. Students will have approximately 80% of their time completing trade tasks using basic tools used by professionals. Students taking these courses can receive based on the actual time in class while under the supervision of a certified journey person teacher apprenticeship hours that will then have the opportunity to continue on their chosen career path. I'd ask all members of the House of Assembly to wish the students and teachers of the Skilled Trade Centre at Sir John A. Uh, well on this exciting endeavour. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Picto West. Mr. Speaker, recently Picto hosted its first Girls Empowerment Day camp organized by the Picto County Women's Resource and Sexual Assault Centre. The focus of the workshop was empowerment, self-esteem and building confidence. Some of the activities included self-esteem workshops, science experiments, entrepreneurship games, confidence building and most importantly, how to apply these skills to everyday life. The scientific component of the day camp camp was added at the request of girls who participated in the past and wanted to stress to other young women that they can take part in a wide variety of interests. I applaud Picto County Women's Resource and Sexual Assault Centre for expanding day camps into Picto so they can reach even more young women and impact more lives positively. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
The Honourable Member for Chester St. Margaret. Mr. Speaker, congratulations on your first day in the chair. Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I rise to congratulate the Aspatog and Heritage Trust on the successful first season of operation for the Aspatog and Ridge Golf Club, located in the growing community of Mill Cove, just outside of Hubbard's. The Aspatog and Heritage Trust encourages and supports the social, environmental, educational, and economic development of the Aspatog and region. The golf course is part of a larger residential development, development in the Mill Cove and Hubbard's area, and the Trust is confident that the golf course's positive social and economic spin-offs will translate into continuing growth and development in the region. Mr. Speaker, I ask the members of the Nova Scotia House of Assembly to join me in congratulating the Aspatogan Ridge Golf Club upon its first year of operation under the auspices of the Aspatogan Heritage Trust, and I wish them success in the years to come. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Mr. Speaker, I would like to recognize Bill Riley, Mark McFarlane, and Craig Martin, all of Amherst. They were recently inducted into the Multi Ethnic Sports Hall of Fame. Bill Riley was the first black Nova Scotian to play in the NHL with Washington and Winnipeg. Mark McFarlane played in the Western Hockey League in Saskatchewan, and Craig played with the NHL in Florida and Winnipeg as well as the AHL in Moncton. These men are an important part of the community sports history and I'm proud to have them represent Amherst in pro sports. The young men and women of our community will look up to them as fine examples and we honour them here today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Lunenburg. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to recognize Torin Jensen, a student from Blue Nose Academy who won the Deb Hands Hands National Contest for students in his age category. Deb Happy Hands is a contest open to grade primary through eight to educate students about the importance of washing their hands. When asked what his entry was, Torin was answered that when asked by his art teacher, Nina Matthews, to draw pictures, he decided to draw some germs. Scott McGrath, hygiene specialist for Deb Canada Incorporate, presented Torin with his prize. Torin was awarded with a $100 gift certificate from Amazon and received a soap dispenser for his home that displays his design. Blue Nose Academy received up to 500 manual Deb soaps and hand sanitizer dispensers, each dis dispenser exhibiting the winning design. The school also received a prize of $500, which they are going to use to purchase some flexible seating for classrooms. Mr. Speaker, I ask that you and all members of this House of Assembly please join me in congratulating Torin Jensen on winning the national contest with Deb Happy Hands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Richmond. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to thank every physician, nurse, home care worker, paramedic and volunteer who takes the extra step to ease the pain and distress felt by palliative care patients who are experiencing life-limiting or life-threatening illnesses. Mr. Speaker, our province has limited beds dedicated for the care of patients at the end of life stage of their illness and often individual health care providers who live in the same communities that are, as our patients take the extra step and go the extra mile to ensure that the patients and their families are well looked after. Mr. Speaker, these individual caregivers are our province's nursing and unsung heroes. They share the stress of our patients and our families, their neighbours, and they provide advice and comfort when needed. Mr. Speaker, I ask this House to join me in sending a huge thank you to the caregivers who know what should be and needs to be done to care for our palliative care patients, and they do it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Clayton Park West. Mr. Speaker, I would like to introduce a man who has taken it upon himself to preserve, to preserve the wilderness in, in his writing. Gabriel DeVoe first got involved with the Blue Mountain Wilderness Park in 2012. He has constructed safe walkways for, for visitors with rocks and stones, and uh, he also put, put up signs to help guide people out of the woods because getting lost in the area is common. Gabe wanted people to have a clear idea of how to get to the lakes to enjoy their pristine beauty. He produced over 14 kilometers of hiking and mountain bike trails for Fox Lake, Ash Lake, Crane Lake, and Hobson Lake. Gabe say, says he volunteers so much of his time because he, uh, he is most comfortable in the outdoors. 
To him, the trails are a treasure. He says he'd like to assemble a team of volunteers to clean up the area as, as garbage has become a, an issue. Mr. Speaker, I would like for this House of Assembly to commend Gabriel Devaux on taking this initiative and contributing to the beauty of the Blue Mountain Trails. Thank you, Gabe. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to congratulate Paige Cox of North Sydney, who graduated from Cape Breton University with a Bachelor of Arts in Community Studies. Paige was diagnosed with multiple learning disabilities, but in grade five, she knew that she wanted to go to university. At, Page, at CBU, Paige found that the Jennifer Keeping Center helps students with learning disabilities, physical restrictions, and psychological limitations. Paige is now at Holland College in the Child and Youth Care Program, and will devote her life to helping others with challenges succeed. I'd like to take this opportunity to wish Paige every success as she fights to make a difference for students in school and in university with disabilities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for King South. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and welcome to the Chair. Mr. Speaker, Nova Scotia is home to so many talented musicians and performers, and today I would like to recognize one of these exceptional artists, Matt Bolzer of Colebrook. On September 15th, Matt was inducted into the Nova Scotia Country, Country Music Hall of Fame. 2018 will mark 20 years in the music business for Matt, and in that time he has released 12 studio albums, made various radio and television appearances, and performed in concert with Grand Ole Opry star Larry Gatlin, Canadian country music legend Carol Baker, and many other Hall of Fame inductees. I would like all the members of the Nova Scotia House of Assembly to join me in congratulating Matt Balser on being inducted into the Nova Scotia Country Music Hall of Fame. We look forward to Matt continuing to entertain Nova Scotian audiences with his unique renditions of classic country songs for years to come. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Queen Shelburne. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to congratulate six grade nine students from the North Queens Community School who, after attending a conference back in May, were immediately inspired to start a girls' program called Girl Talk for grades four to six. They meet twice a month after school and focus on positive peer mentoring, exploring new skills, engaging in science and technology, as well as building confidence and self-esteem. Mr. Speaker, these girls are dreaming big and are passionate about making a difference in girls' lives in their school. I look forward to seeing further developments as their program unfolds. Congratulations for channeling your enthusiasm into such a worthwhile cause. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Yarmouth. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The annual hospital, hospital hellabaloo in support of Yarmouth Hospital Foundation will take place this weekend at Mariner Centre. Carrying on a tradition that goes back more than a century, the Hullabaloo is an initiative of the Yarmouth Hospital's Women Auxiliary and is one of the biggest flea markets in the Tri-Counties. This year, the Auxiliary is raising money for a urology laser device, and their goal is to raise $53,500. I'd like to encourage everyone in the Tri-Counties to attend and support a great cause at this year's Hullabaloo on Saturday, September 22nd at the Mariner Centre in Yarmouth. I'd also like to thank the dedicated volunteers of the Yarmouth Hospital's Women Auxiliary for their countless hours of hard work that goes into organizing this important event. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to commend Tim Dobson, teacher at Prince Andrew High School. At the beginning of the 27-2018 school year, he promised his students that he would always tell them the truth. When a problem occurred during a final film project, he told his students that he would stay at the school until the problem was resolved. Even if he had to stay until midnight, he kept that promise, Mr. Speaker. Throughout the school year, he shared what he calls his Tim's Bits of Wisdom, reminding his students that they are valued with a lot to offer the world. Mr. Speaker, I ask all members of the House to join me in thanking Tim Dobson and all our teachers in Nova Scotia for seeing the value of each and every student. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Lunenburg West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Bridgewater's Courtney Baker, a third-year player on the Dow Tigers volleyball team, made a smooth transition from playing the right side to center for the 2017-18 season. This special athlete led the Atlantic Conference with nine assists per set and led the Tigers to a 19-1 regular season record. Even more impressive, Courtney helped her team claim the sixth straight Atlantic University Sports Women's Volleyball title and she was named the league MVP. 
She was also named a first team all-star for the second consecutive season and represented Canada on the 2017 senior national team. According to Dell coach Rick Scott, Courtney is a dominant, highly skilled athletic player and is one of the top players in the country. He said that she had a tremendous season quarterback in the offense, but is also a key team leader. Congratulations to Courtney Baker, a strong, confident, hardworking female athlete who is a role model to all Nova Scotia athletes and demonstrates that the sky is the limit. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Pictou Centre. Uh, Mr. Speaker, a placard recognizing the accomplishments of Les Babe Mason and Blay Turnbull was unveiled Sunday, August 26th in their hometown of Stellarton. The town honored the Olympic athletes by having a park named after them. Both athletes competed in the Olympic Games. Turnbull is a member of Team Canada's women's hockey team last February in South Korea, and Mason is a boxer in the 1956 Olympics in Melbourne, Australia. A beautiful park in the town was renamed Olympic Park, recognizing their success in sports. The community of Sellerton are very proud of the fact they have two residents that competed at this level. I would like all members of the, this legislature to join me in thanking the town of Sellerton for recognizing and honoring Babe and Blair. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to congratulate Halifax Needham resident Leslie Lowe on the publication of her book, published by Coach House, No Place to Go, How Public Toilets Fail Our Private Needs. It's a tour of public bathrooms from London, England, to San Francisco, to the Halifax Commons. It's readable, entertaining, and provides a new lens through which to examine urban design, disability rights, homelessness, and gender equity. The author, Leslie Lowe, is a freelance journalist and journalism instructor, and because she's also a friend, I know that she's really good at juggling a lot. This book, which she completed along with a Master's of Fine Arts in Creative Nonfiction at the University of King's College, is a huge accomplishment that will be ce celebrated tonight with a book launch at the Art Bar, very close to here. I ask all members of the House to please join me in congratulating Leslie Lowe. The Honourable Member for Bedford. Mr. Speaker, I want to tell you about a super volunteer in my riding. Joan Magilotti is one of those people who always step up to help. In fact, at the Bedford Volunteer Awards in May, this is how she was introduced. Need help with something? Call Joan. For nearly 40 years, Joan has given back to her church and community, always with boundless energy and enthusiasm. Joan has been involved in St. Ignatius Catholic Church, the Catholic Women's League, and Chalice, the Bedford-based charity that helps children in developing countries. And quite frankly, a full list of her various offices held and committees served would take me well beyond my allotted time, and I hear the new deputy speaker is a real stickler. What I do want to say is that these organizations and others Others have been well supported by my friend and neighbour and I'm delighted to be able to recognize her faithful and selfless service here in the House today. The Honourable Member, oh, uh, the, the Honourable Member from Pictou East on an introduction. You know who I am, Mr. Speaker, don't you? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to introduce two, two young uh, political enthusiasts we have in the House with us today. Riley Hill Petipa is no stranger to this house. He comes down in his free classes and takes in the proceedings. Thank you, Riley. And he's brought to Dylan uh, McGrath here, making his first appearance. If they could stand and receive the welcome of the house. Thank you for coming, guys. The Honourable Member from Coal Harbour Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today I rise to recognize a breast cancer survivor dragon boat team called Bosom Buddies. The team paddles on Lake Bonuk and this year attended an international festival in Florence, Italy. The event took place in early July 2018. Some members of the team are from our Coal Harbour Eastern Passage constituency. Debbie Kennedy of Cow Bay and Christine Broyden of Eastern Passage placed 23rd out of 125 teams and we're happy to have supporter Michelle Morash of Cow Bay alongside them. Them. All members of the Bosom Buddies team pre presently have breast cancer or are in remission. I ask all members of the Nova Scotia Legislature to join me in congratulating this outstanding team. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Colchester North. Thank you, Mr. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In 2014, the staff and auxiliary of the Lillian Fraser Memorial Hospital in Tatamagush wanted to create a space where patients, especially those who have an extended stay, their families and the health care staff, a place where they could go outside to enjoy fresh air and natural sunlight in a relaxing and safe environment. Fundraising for the Healing Garden came from the efforts of the hospital auxiliary, which held a chowder fest in March, a strawberry fest in July, and also the help from Sarah Bonneman's open house in October. They also received donations from the community through Scotiabank, memorials, and personal donations. The auxiliary funded the main construction of the garden, but donations are still being collected to do the landscaping. The hospital and the auxiliary celebrated the Healing Garden and their 50 years of service this year with a special event. The Lillian Fraser Memorial Hospital has been a vital part of Tadamagush and the surrounding communities for 50 years and they are to be congratulated. The Honourable Member from Sackville Beaverbank. Ah, uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I wish to uh, take an opportunity today to wish James Harris Johns a very happy 74th birthday today. Mr. Speaker, not only has Jim been one of my strongest supporters along my political journey over the years, but he's also my father, so I want to wish my dad happy birthday today. The Honourable Member for Halifax Armdale. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in the last few years, constituents have enjoyed the nature and recreation facilities at Lawn Lake Provincial Park. This year, thanks to the Polly Sisters of Armdale, there was an exciting new adventure. In July, Sarah Polly and her sister launched Lawn Lake Adventure Company, a kayak and paddle boat rental enterprise, with the assistance of their father. With a variety of kayak models available, they offer an option for all, from the curious child who's a first-time kayaker to the entire family with double kayaks that can accommodate four. Sarah grew up paddling on the Northwest Arm and recognized the lack of available rentals in the area. I'm happy to see her start this new business. I ask all members to thank the Pauley sisters for their entrepreneurial spirit and commitment to using their energy in their community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Claire Digby. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Through the school year, as those school years just started, a group of eight students from Digby Regional High School are already fundraising for their trip to Kenya this March through the Me to We program. Me to We, a social enterprise, encourages people to work together to change the world. For a short time, people to get to live in a community and work on a sustainable development project. Recently, Olivia Walker, one of the group, and an avid swimmer raised $1,000 through a swimathon. Her sponsors paid her $10 a lap. Local restaurants are also helping to give by emptying their bottles. This is inspiring to that group of youth. Are, this is inspiring that that group of youth are working so hard to raise funds so that on their March break they will be able to live in a community so far from their own and help to build a school or a safe water program. I want to recognize Olivia and all of her classmates for going to Kenya on this adventure. They will learn so much during their time there and will have a positive impact on their community. To quote Olivia, it will be an amazing experience. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cole Harbour, Portland Valley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to acknowledge the great work of one of our local nonprofit organizations, the Cole Harbour Heritage Farm Museum. It is a community museum dedicated to preserving and interpreting Cole Harbour's agricultural past and developing an awareness to horticulture, livestock care, and farming in general. For today's, for today's generation, this unique urban farm and museum works, in, it works with a volunteer board from Cole Harbor Heritage Farm Society. The museum relies heavily on community support, volunteers, and visitor donations. Their great work helps bring hundreds of visitors to the farm every season and in turn also to the area. This year, the farm had a number of great programs uh, like preparing the garden for winter and operating bla a blacksmith shop.
a summer program for kids, and opportunities to explore the marsh. I wish to thank the Car Harbor Heritage Farm and all its volunteers for the hard work and dedication to this community and its heritage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Timberley Prospect. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to recognize Ian Angus, real estate agent with Laura LePage for his support at the Fun Zone sponsor at the fourth annual BLT Canada event for the kids. Ian has been a strong community supporter and a host of a number of events and activities in the community. Ian is, as has been, a very successful in highlighting the qualities, assets and amenities of our community to clients, resulting in the purchase of new homes for families in the community. In fact, he is so good at building our community, the area is sometimes referred to as Angusville. I would like the members of the Nova Scotia House of Assembly to join me in congratulating Ian Angus for his contribution to community and for having an excellent first name. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much for those member statements. We'll now get ready to move on to oral questions put by members to ministers. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question's for the Premier. This government has a complicated, perplexed relationship with privacy. This government fails to protect the personal information of FOIA POP users and pharmacy patients, but it's all hands on deck for their own secrets, Mr. Speaker. We were reminded yesterday that the former Minister of Health and the current Minister of Communities, Culture and Heritage used a private, a private account to shield communications from the FOIA POP system. The FOIA POP Commissioner is now demanding those emails be made available to her, and rightly so. Will the Premier ensure that the Minister in question complies with the request of the FOIA POP Commissioner? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable for the question. I want to inform this House. Uh, when the situation was brought to the, the Minister's attention, he acknowledged the fact, Mr. Speaker, that information had been sent from government account to his Gmail account. Uh, he has stopped that practice, Mr. Speaker, and uh, now his government work is done on his government account and his constituency work is done on his own account. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, we also remember when the Premier admitted, proudly admitted, that he conducts his communications by phone with the express purpose of ensuring it won't fall under freedom of information guidelines. He has deliberately pushed the boundaries of his duty to document the decisions he makes and the considerations that go into those decisions. It is no wonder that the former Minister of Health wouldn't take the FOIA POP Commissioner seriously when he sees the example the Premier is setting. So I ask, did the Premier direct his Minister to retain the emails that the Commissioner has demanded, and does he know if they even still exist? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, again, I want to thank the all member for the question. Again, I want to tell one of the uh, situations brought to the to, uh, Minister's attention. The Minister has acknowledged the mistake and change practice. I do want to say to the Honourable Member, she's absolutely right. I do do a lot of uh, verbal communication. I want to tell her for that. We have the highest credit rating, Mr. Speaker, in the history of this province. I want to, I want to, I want to continue to remind her, I, I continue to want to remind her that we have grown our exports by $2 billion, Mr. Speaker. I want to continue to remind her that population growth is at an all-time high. I want to tell you we're on the back of three successful years of growing in the tourism industry. Mr. Speaker, the work continues. Oh, yeah. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the Premier's, I'm kind of speechless actually, the Premier's disregard for the FOIA POP Commissioner is, is actually astounding, really. He says she doesn't need to be an independent officer of this House. Not only does he refuse to comply with her directions and skirt the rules for documentation, but his office directly interferes with the FOIA POP Commissioner's efforts. According to the review report, the Premier's office refused to make staff available for an interview. So I will ask the Premier, would the Premier interfere in similar requests by the Auditor General or the Ombudsman? 
The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, the request, uh, Mr. Speaker, the request was made to the clerk. As the Honourable Member knows, she stands in this house many times, uh, would know that the officer does not have this power, uh, Mr. Speaker, to subpoena people as witnesses. She would also know, Mr. Speaker, she paid attention to the very fact what the uh, what was asked of the minister. What was asked of the minister, minister identified was the issue. We solved the problem. Case was closed, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Uh, well, the, uh, the email account of which my colleague speaks uh, was uh, under the oversight and care of the then Minister of Health's uh, executive assistant. And when the Information and Privacy Commissioner uh, requested to be able to interview that person, uh, the response she received came uh, from uh, a deputy minister in the premier's office to say that that uh, that interview was not going to take place. So the premier has been asked by my colleague for an explanation, but I don't believe we've heard it for this interference in this investigation. The honourable premier, Mr. Speaker, it was not uh, the premier's office as you would, as you are describing it from the political side, Mr. Speaker. The clerk is also the head of public service. The request was going in to ask for uh, uh, the officer wanted to interview someone she does not have the authority to interview. Uh, the clerk, upon looking at that, realized that the very thing she wanted to interview him on had already been dealt with. We actually agreed with the FOIPOP officer that the minister should not be using his personal account. We fixed that problem. The minister acknowledged that. That is what the process was going through, Mr. Speaker. That's why the decision was made by the clerk. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. The information, or information Commissioner has, uh, has cautioned that uh, it's possible for personal emails to be uh, wrongly used to provide shield for material from legitimate uh, freedom of information requests. Now, the government, uh, uh, she says, failed in this case to make any effort to comply uh, with a legitimate freedom of information request for personal emails that had been used in the minister's public capacity. And this, she says in her report, was uh, offside and was out of line. Now, the, the premier is responsible for the, the tone, the standard of transparency and forthrightness of the entire administration. So I want to ask, does this behavior meet the standard that he sets? Honourable Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, what happened was there was a FOIA prop request coming in uh, by an agency, Mr. Speaker. They were looking for an entire year window. What would back them? Can you narrow the scope? They narrowed the scope to three months. All of the information and all of the, uh, the, the, the requests that they were looking for was turned over to that applicant, Mr. Speaker. I don't know the number of uh, pages there were, but they were turned over to the applicant who asked for the information, Mr. Speaker. That's how that process works. There was nothing uh, hidden from the person who actually asked for the information. We turned it over to them. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Hey. Commissioner Tully has made a number of recommendations flowing out of this investigation, but none of these is binding because her office doesn't have the power to enforce them. And prior to the election, the Premier had said that if elected, these are so the quotation, he would expand the powers and mandate of the Office of the Information and Privacy Commissioner, particularly through granting her order-making powers. And earlier this week, the Premier said this was no longer uh, the view that he takes and that that previous view had been mistaken. But does the Premier understand that his change of heart on this front uh, gives every indication of a, a person who is being opportunistic about their integrity and selective about honouring their word? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the Honourable Member for the question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm very proud of my track record of dealing with Nova Scotians, communicating directly even when there's difficult information that's required to be handed out, Mr. Speaker. I go and do that on behalf of our government, Mr. Speaker. That is the role that I've accepted. That's the role I ask for, and I'll continue to do so. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I do want to I, I uh, say to the Honourable Member, uh, we go through the information, we require the information, we put it out. Uh, what the uh, information officer, Mr. Speaker, is looking for. We replied almost all the recommendations she puts forward. I will, we will look at those ones, Mr. Speaker, we go through. We'll continue to make sure that we do that. But I want to go back, uh, Mr. Speaker, to the very uh, the beginning of this particular situation was there was, a, there was the, the, the information officer said to the former Minister of Health, and now current Minister of Communities, Culture and Heritage, you shouldn't be doing government work on your Gmail account. He agreed. We accepted it. He moved on. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. 
My question is for the Premier. Just yesterday, actually, the Premier insisted the Privacy Commissioner has all the authority and independence she needs. Well, he said that reasonable governments fulfill the recommendations of the Privacy Commissioner, and so there was no need to make her an officer of the Legislature. By the Premier's reasoning, the federal Liberal government, the Liberal government of Prince Edward Island, and the Liberal government in Quebec are not being reasonable. The FOIPOP Commissioner has determined that the Department of Justice lacks sufficient reason to keep secret the documents about the 2014 uh, death of an inmate. She recommended the documents be made available. So I will ask the Premier, will he please be reasonable, release the documents the Privacy Commissioner says the Department of Justice has improperly kept a secret. The Honourable Premier. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Department of Justice continue to have these requests. We have the balance, the issue of how do we protect individual privacy, Mr. Speaker, at the same time making the information available that people requested. It's always the balance that we go through. I'm very proud of the work of the Minister of Justice has been doing on behalf of all Nova Scotians, and he'll continue to do so. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. In 2013, the PC Caucus Office submitted a FOIA POP request to the Department of Community Services asking for information about the government's decision to cancel Phase 3 of the Riverview Adult Residential Facility in Pictou County. Our office received a heavily redacted document, and we appealed the government's heavy-handed approach to keep that information a secret. The FOIA POP Commissioner agreed with us, saying that to automatically keep draft documents a secret is using the advice to minister exemption too broadly. Despite all of this, the department said it would not abide by the FOIA POP commissioner's ruling, which is a shame, Mr. Speaker. Will the premier, once again, please be reasonable, abide by the privacy commissioner's ruling, and ensure that the Department of Community Services releases all the information about Riverview facility? The Honourable Premier. Speaker, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Most Nova Scotians know that I'm reasonable all the time, Mr. Speaker. The reality of it is, the reality of it is, Mr. Speaker, the fact of the matter is, we we have to strike the balance of making sure that the information that's allowed to go out, Mr. Speaker, can go out, and information that's protecting personal privacy or, or uh, issues around other aspects that should be kept private, Mr. Speaker, are done so uh, following the regulations in around the FOIA POP. The honourable member for Cape Breton Centre. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Last night, the CBRM Council passed a resolution reaffirming their support of maintaining rural and community hospitals and actually denouncing the pending closures of New Waterford Consolidated and Northside General. Mr. Speaker, does the Premier want to retract his previous statements characterizing opposition to his decision to close these hospitals as noise? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, again, I want to thank uh, the Honourable Member for the question. I'm very proud of the work that we've been doing, Mr. Speaker, going into communities to make sure that they have the appropriate health care infrastructure that meets the needs of that particular community today, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue to make sure we modernize health care infrastructure so that we continue to attract uh, health care professionals into our communities across this province, Mr. Speaker, and we're going to continue to move forward on the, on, on the work that we've started in Cape Breton. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre. Thank you, Mr. S Speaker. Sadly, progress is not closing facilities. Mr. Speaker, the people of Cape Breton feel they have been abandoned by this government. We start by losing services, and then we lose whole hospitals. We lose doctors to better pay in Halifax. We're losing our kids who can't get treatment for mental health issues at home or with an injured eye. We have to fight tooth and nail to keep anything we want, and we're told that for these hospitals, the decision has already been made. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier apologize to the residents of Cape Breton for his neglect in health care system in Cape Breton? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, like her government and previous governments, I was not going to allow politics to interfere to do what was appropriate for the people of Cape Breton and ensure to provide them with the appropriate health care infrastructure. The easiest and simplest thing for me to have done would have been to ignore the problem that her party did and her government did. The reality of it is they need new health care infrastructure. We're going to deliver on that commitment, Mr. Speaker. We're going to improve the regional hospital, Mr. Speaker. We're going to ensure that we can recruit, retain health care providers to give Kay Bretners, Mr. Speaker, the health care that they deserve, just like every other Nova Scotian that had been ignored by that party. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. 
Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. Today, the FOIPOP Commissioner made a report available regarding her investigation into the former Minister of Health using private email addresses. In the end, the Privacy Commissioner made six recommendations. All six are reasonable actions to increase government transparency. Yesterday, the Premier said if a province had a reasonable government, Yesterday, the Premier said if a province has a reasonable government in place, there is no need to give the Privacy Commissioner independence or authority because of a reasonable government will follow through the Commissioner's recommendation. So my question to the Minister of Health is, will the Minister of Health act in a reasonable way and follow all six recommendations contained in the Commissioner's report? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. As the, the member would know, there's a report uh, provided uh, just uh, yesterday, I believe, uh, from the uh, office of uh, the uh, privacy officer. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, there'll be a response uh, provided to that report uh, in the time frame allotted. Thank you. The Honourable House Leader for the official opposition. So, Mr. Speaker, I'll pivot over to the Minister of uh, Internal Services uh, because some of the some of the recommendations uh, talked about her uh, responsibilities. The Commissioner's report de detailed at least uh, for occasions when uh, IEP or information access and privacy officials declined to answer questions or refused to carry out a request of the Office of the Privacy and Info Information Commissioner investigators. Now, the report says there's a don't tell don't ask records management philosophy at IEP. That does not sound like the practices of a reasonable government. Will the Minister of Internal Services act immediately to fix the culture at IEP from don't tell, don't ask to one of transparency and openness? The Honourable Minister of Internal Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I really would like to thank the member for his question. I, I want to start off by assuring the member that our staff at IAP provide supports across all government departments. They're available at any time. They're working, they work with all departments to make sure that a request that gets put in is answered in the most appropriate fashion as possible. Um, as the Premier stated, as the Minister stated, we have, our, we have the report. We will review the report and we will absolutely work to consider all the recommendations from the privacy officer. But I also would like to take the opportunity to talk about how, since our government has come into power, we have worked and advocated for more transparency. We are the first government in the province's history to impl implement an open data portal. Where Without looking for information, data, data is, is there available and accessible to the residents of Nova Scotia. I also would like to talk about how quickly our FOIPOP request turnaround time has been. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Thank you. I'll go to another question. Uh, the province, and this is the Minister of Justice, uh, the province is now engaged in an ongoing court action against a former Department uh, of Justice lawyer. A Toronto Bay Street lawyer is representing the government as well as the Premier and the Attorney General. A uh, FOIPOP request from the PC Caucus Office asking on how much the Bay Street lawyer is being paid for part of his legal services was refused, and I will uh, table that request. The IAP administrator said her office was not entitled to that information. The big city lawyer is getting paid in taxpayers' do dollars, Mr. Speaker. My question to the minister is why is the minister keeping his bills secret? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank, thank, you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, just to follow up to my colleague's comments, um, the complexity and volume of FOIPOP requests continue to grow, Mr. Speaker, and over the period of this increase in demand on that service, we continue to hit our 80% target within 30 days, Mr. Speaker. The circumstances of this particular case, I just want to say as well, Mr. Speaker, that, that there are more applications being completed than previously, Mr. Speaker. There's a higher compliance rate than previous, Mr. Speaker. And there's a lower rate of deemed refusals, Mr. Speaker. This is progress when it comes to freedom of information and protection of privacy. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. The refusal to give billing, illegal billing information sets a precedent, precedence in secrecy, even for this government. In the past, the PC caucus has requested and received billing information by this government's favourite lawyer, Mr. Jack Graham. The government didn't even put up a fight when we asked for that kind of information. They just handed over Jack's bills. So my question to the minister as well, why are the bills of local lawyers free for the taking, but the government is keeping Bay Street legal bills secret? The Honourable Minister of Justice. 
Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my colleague for the question. Uh, as I indicated earlier, Mr. Speaker, the work that is being undertaken within uh, the FOIPOP policies and, and mandates uh, are hitting our targets, Mr. Speaker, and we're actually exceeding those targets. We'll continue, Mr. Speaker, with those efforts in vain, always with an open mind to try and improve this particular process. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, my minister, question is to the Minister of Health. Countless Nova Scotians are taking on the role of unpaid family caregiver. Caregivers Nova Scotia says that on, on average, a caregiver spends 26 hours per week helping a loved one. If caregivers become unable to aid the person needing their help, in too many cases that patient would have no care at all. Caregivers Nova Scotia says that the wait time for home care is still extremely high in this province. As a result, caregivers are getting burnt out. So my question is the Minister, when can Nova Scotians expect this government to reduce home care wait times and give the caregivers, caregivers the help they need and deserve? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. As the member would know, we've uh, invested uh, heavily in expanding uh, home care services. We've, in fact, made significant uh, improvement in home care wait times for Nova Scotians uh, looking to uh, uh, or who require these services. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, in some parts of the province, uh, the wait list has actually been virtually eliminated. And with respect to uh, caregivers in the home, Mr. Speaker, family members or community members providing uh, care, we've actually expanded uh, our uh, supports uh, through the uh, Caregiver Benefit Program, Mr. Speaker, and there's more to come. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Mr. Speaker, perhaps you can do a ride along with some home care workers in Cape Breton because they're not feeling the same as we're hearing from this Minister. Unpaid caregivers not only spend significant time aiding a loved one, but they also administer a wide range of their needs, such as injections, medications, and wound care, to name a few. The problem is a very large portion of caregivers are not professionally trained to take on these tasks. Caregivers Nova Scotia is flooded with calls looking for help, and they can only do so much with very limited resources. So my, too, many, too many delicate procedures are being downloaded to family members who are just trying to look after their loved ones. Will the minister commit to improving home care funding to those who are struggling before an unintended accident happens? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. As I uh, previously mentioned uh, to the member, two uh, important uh, factors. Number one, uh, we have uh, expanded uh, our investment significantly over the uh, past number of years, uh, each year uh, towards home care services, Mr. Speaker. That's an important part because we've heard from Nova Scotians that uh, they want to stay at home as long as they can, uh, and we need to make sure that we provided the services that were required. We've seen in many parts of the province where the uh, wait list has been virtually eliminated. Mr. Speaker, we continue to uh, monitor and work uh, with our partners and those uh, services being provided. As I mentioned, uh, Mr. Speaker, earlier this year we expanded the uh, benefit for uh, payment for uh, caregivers in the province, Mr. Speaker, and we have a commitment to do even more. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Education. In March, the Commission on Inclusive Education released their final report based on hundreds of hours of consultation with thousands of Nova Scotians. The report included a well-researched implementation plan divided into five key stages. The timeline for stage one ended August 2018. Despite a significant budget allocation to hire some of the already badly needed specialists, the government seems intent to follow its own agenda and has ignored the other 13 key actions for the first stage. Mr. Speaker, will the minister explain why his government chose to ignore the recommendation to develop Cape Breton and Halifax intensive treatment programs? The Honourable the Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the member's question. Uh, we're moving forward with the uh, report on inclusive education's recommendations. Uh, I'm happy to say that we are now at about 95% of our uh, hirings that need to happen to have these additional supports in the system. Mr. Speaker, we're going to keep working at this step by step so that we have a system of education in Nova Scotia that's equitable, that ensures every single student, no matter which part of the province um, they're being educated in, has the same chance of success, and where uh, special needs supports are delivered uh, consistently in the way um, that will have the greatest impact on their well-being and achievement. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Mr. Speaker, this government is following its own agenda and not any review or report. They like to answer every problem with the review or report, but we don't see the implementation. We know from the Commission on Inclusion that our education system is not truly inclusive and it is not serving anyone as well as it should. Not students, not parents, not teachers, not support staff. 
This is a complex issue, and we now have a detailed roadmap and a policy framework, but sadly we know that the government has decided not to establish an institute for inclusive education which would have overseen these efforts. We can't improve the state of inclusive education in this province if we skip stage one of the Commission's implementation plan entirely. Mr. Speaker, will the minister explain why he also chose not to develop an inclusive education policy framework, including new behaviour, mental health and autism strategies and guidelines which are so badly needed? Honourable Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. On the question of the Institute, um, we are not following through with that recommendation because we want the million dollars it would cost to establish that institute and continue it annually to actually go into the classroom, Mr. Speaker. And, and uh, to be honest, Mr. Speaker, for that member to suggest we're not following through with the recommendations on the inclusive education um, uh, report when it's that member, her party, and all members of the opposition who actually voted against the additional dollars that were required to be put in the system, I find completely astounding. That member, that member has voted against has voted against every single investment that we've made in education. That member has argued against pre-primary. That member has um, defended the status quo of a system that she herself has said is failing, Mr. Speaker. And the fact is, no matter what that member says, no matter what those parties try to do to prevent us from achieving our end goals in education, we're going to plow forward and do the very best that we can for our kids. Member for Victoria the Lakes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Order, Mr. Please. Speaker, my question is for the Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Fisheries and Aquaculture. Over the past while, and especially the last few days, I've received numerous calls from concerned constituents about the situation concerning the Inganish Ferry breakwater. The ocean water is now flowing into the harbour due to further erosion of the breakwater and is in desperate need of armour stone. If this issue is not addressed, a strong storm surge will most certainly threaten the 17 vessels that are docked there, as well as residential homes, a wetland and the Cabot Trail connecting Inganish Ferry to Inganish Beach. So my question for the Minister is, has the Minister been in contact with the local Harbour Authority and federal small craft harbour officials to address this situation? The Honourable Minister of Fisheries. Uh, thank you very much for the question. And uh, indeed, uh, I have not received correspondence from him at this point, uh, on, and we would be very interested in getting more information on the question. The Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this issue has been going on for the last five years, but has reached a critical point given the harsher weather, weather conditions our coastlines are experiencing. Fishers have been become extremely frustrated navigating the back and forth between both levels of government. The federal government says it's a provincial issue. The provincial Department of Fisheries said, said it's a TIR issue. Then it goes back to being a federal issue and fishers and residents are left wondering who is responsible. So my question to the minister is, will he commit to working with the local harbour authority as soon as possible to navigate the system and address this critical situation local fishers are experiencing? The Honourable Minister of Fisheries. Thank you very, again very much for the uh, question. It's a very important question all over Nova Scotia when the harbours are, are affected. Most of the time it's the responsibility of DFO and small crafts and harbours, but I'd be willing to work with the member to address this issue and see who is really responsible, see if we can help the fishermen in that regard. The Honourable Member for Sackville Beaverbank. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I have a local question today for the uh, Minister of Transportation. On May the 16th, 2018, a terrible accident occurred at the intersection of Old Sackville and Beaverbank Roads when a vehicle attempted to turn left. A 28-year-old woman who was passenger in the car died at the scene. Subsequent to this fatal accident, there have been three other accidents in the same location, all involving vehicles turning left. 
Since this is a provincially controlled intersection, the minister and DOT staff did meet with me in May. However, that was three months ago since our meeting and I've had no further updates. My question is, four accidents in four months is not acceptable. Can the minister inform this house if his department has reviewed this intersection for a designated left-hand turning lane and a reduction for speed limit in this location? The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for the question. I was very pleased to meet with him and one of his other uh, council, uh, uh, former council colleagues to discuss this, discuss this matter. And we really are appreciative of these situations when they're brought forward to the department because our concern, of course, number one, is the priority of the safety of the people who are in the motoring public. We, we have taken a look at that intersection. The issue of a left turning lane is being, being reviewed. Sometimes when those happen, if we don't have enough ramp area up to it, it endangers, it creates more danger than it solves. Uh, but I'll be happy to find out where that's at at the present time. The Honourable Member for Sackville Beaverbank. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And you know, some of the concerns, this intersection is less than two kilometers away from uh, two schools. There are students walking there, school buses drive by there and turn there daily. It's a high volume of vehicles, over 26,000 cars a day that go through that intersection. The solutions here are neither financially or work intensive. All they require is a reduction in the speed limit in this area and a, a flashing green light on an already signalized intersection. It continues to be an, a disaster every day until this is resolved. So can the minister please tell me when his department will be installing a left-hand turn signal at this intersection and lowering the speed limit? The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I would like to uh, remind the House <clears throat> that in our most recent budget, uh, we included a significant uh, um, volume of dollars, $30 million, to review specific safety issues in the province, uh, one of uh, which in this year's uh, allocation is being deployed in the Cape Breton area, which has enabled us to look at particularly difficult circumstances that uh, present themselves uh, as growth occurs, as, as what has happened in that particular area, and the ability of the highway system to accommodate the, uh, the growth. So we will look uh, at this particular intersection in view of that safety fund that we have. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question again is the Minister of Health. This government made a promise to Nova Scotians that they would have a family doctor. Sadly, the list continues to grow with each passing day as this government demonstrates their inability to track doctors. Many of my constituents without a family doctor rely on the emergency room for care, just like many other Nova Scotians across this province. For my constituents who rely on the Northside General Emergency Room, they've been hit hardest as the emergency room has been closed the entire month of August and so far five days in September. So my question to the Minister, will the Minister come to North Sydney on September 23rd, share his plan for health care in the Cape Breton Regional Municipality, and take direction from the Minister of Fisheries. And Mr. Speaker, a reasonable minister would answer just yes or no. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to uh, highlight uh, for the member uh, opposite uh, and to, for all the House the, the important work that's ongoing. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with the uh, partners of the Nova Scotia Health Authority and the IWK as, we go, as it relates to recruitment, Mr. Speaker, of primary health care professionals. Uh, in the last 18 months, Mr. Speaker, we've recruited uh, about 170 uh, physicians in the province of Nova Scotia, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this is in part supported by uh, changes to our incentive program. Programs, Mr. Speaker, changes to our compensation, uh, Mr. Speaker, as well. Uh, I'd uh, defer to the member to take a look at a, a recent release uh, today about uh, the recent success just since April of this year, Mr. Speaker, on recruitment of physicians in Nova Scotia. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Mr. Speaker, this is ridiculous. A simple question, a yes or no answer. To get that rambling on, the people that I represent at home, Mr. Speaker, they don't appreciate that. I don't appreciate that, and nobody on this side of the government appreciates that. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I asked a simple question to the Minister. Will he come to North Sydney, attend a rally in, 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 in North Sydney, tell the people what the plan is for health care in Cape Breton, especially on the North side? Mr. Speaker, it's a simple one question, yes or no, please. The Honourable Minister of Health. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, what I can assure the member opposite is uh, that uh, the importance and the priority of this government, uh, Mr. Speaker, myself and the department, our partners, the Nova Scotia Health Authority, the IWK, and other frontline health care professionals is the pro providing the care that Nova Scotians need and deserve in this province, in all parts of the province, Mr. Speaker. What I can uh, tell the member opposite, uh, again, as he continues to ask the question, Mr. Speaker, is that we're investing in his community, Mr. Speaker, investing in new infrastructure, we're expanding long-term care facilities, Mr. Speaker, we're investing in regional hospital, Mr. Speaker, to expand cancer care, to expand emergency department access, bringing new infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, which will continue the ongoing efforts for recruitment and retention of physicians in his community. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Since 2013, our province has had a goal of designating at least 13% of our landmass as protected areas. That, that is a goal the Premier affirmed and highlighted in mandate letters to the Minister of Environment and the Minister of Natural Resources. Advocates were assured that the Liberal government would meet the goal during its first mandate, but the government has failed to deliver on that commitment. We are still sitting at 12.3% and there has been no action on this file since. So my question for the Premier is when will this government deliver on its commitment to protect 13% of our landmass? The Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. Uh, she is right. We continue to move towards 13%. I think it's 12.4% now. We have a number of parcels that have been reviewed that are within the, in the departments. Uh, those will be brought forward, uh, Mr. Speaker, after all the assessment is done on them to uh, allow us to move towards and get to uh, 13%. The Honourable Member for Halifax, Needham. Mr. Speaker, 90% of the plan's designated areas are just waiting for official protection, which could be done by an order in Council. The land, like as in the Wentworth Valley Wilderness Area, has already been purchased specifically for the purpose of protection. Why? Isn't the Premier taking that last step, living up to its commitments on land protection? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, as I said earlier in my question, uh, when a uh, parcel is identified, Mr. Speaker, it goes through a process. The departments are putting through that process. There's a number of uh, parcels of land that are going through that uh, process right now. I expect to see some of them before the Executive Council, Mr. Speaker, in the not-too-distant future. Uh, they will then be reviewed uh, and determined, but uh, we're committed to making sure that we get to 13 uh, percent, and we will do so. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. The Dartmouth General Hospital is currently undergoing millions of dollars in much-needed renovations. I, along with everyone who uses the Dartmouth General, am excited about the res uh, renovations taking place and can't wait to see the completed improvements. However, earlier this year, staff told me that none of the millions of dollars allotted to the project will help provide emergency psychiatric care. It remains the only regional hospital in the province without emergency psychiatric care. My question to the Minister is this, Mr. Speaker. Why is the government putting off providing the people of Dartmouth with badly needed emergency psychiatric care? Thank the you. Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I assure uh, you, the, yourself, the members uh, opposite, uh, that uh, mental health is one of our, our key priority areas in, in the province. Uh, it's one of the key items within my mandate, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we continue to invest uh, heavily in expanding mental health uh, care and supports uh, across the province, Mr. Speaker, in the central zone and uh, all other parts of the province. Uh, indeed, as the member would know, a lot of our efforts has been focused uh, at uh, youth uh, services uh, within communities, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we know that uh, the benefits of investing there, particularly mental health, will pay dividends and provide uh, reduce the demands on uh, the more acute areas of our system. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Speaker, many hospitals in this province have their emergency departments closed on a regular basis due to a lack of physicians. The Dartmouth General Emergency Department stays open, but they still don't have the capacity to provide the emergency mental health care that patients desperately need. Let's stop and think, Mr. Speaker. What does it say about the state of our health care that my constituents lack proper access to emergency mental health services, and yet I feel fortunate because our ER doesn't close? I'm sure there are members on both sides of this House, Mr. Speaker, that would rather have my problems than the problems facing their communities. My question is this, Mr. Speaker. 
Is crossing the harbour the only option to Dartmouth residents in need of emergency mental health care? Thank you, the Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. As uh, the member would know, uh, depending on the uh, the nature of mental health as with our, our physical health, Mr. Speaker. Uh, there are a variety of uh, conditions that one may present with, uh, more or, or less uh, acute, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, presenting and, and being assessed uh, for uh, mental health uh, conditions in an emergency room like in Dartmouth General. Uh, individuals can uh, receive uh, care and support and counselling uh, and, and directed, Mr. Speaker, to uh, appropriate resources and follow-up, as would be the case uh, for certain uh, physical ailments. Uh, Mr. Speaker, when in a crisis, however, all Nova Scotians uh, have access to our crisis line to receive the, the care and the supports that are needed, Mr. Speaker. People can, uh, can actually uh, assess and uh, work with them over the phone and make sure the necessary resources are brought uh, to them in those uh, more acute uh, situations as well. The Honourable Member for Sydney River, Myra Lewisburg. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, my question through you is to the Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, I hear I'm talking about how all the investment is being made in Cape Breton Island, how they're going to increase the size of the hospital, how they're going to make more use of the facilities that are there. And I see where the minister himself had to start the clapping because nobody else thinks it's, a, it's the appropriate way to go forward. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to say this to that minister. I want to know if he will join the men member from Cape Breton Centre, the member from Victoria the Lakes, the member from Northside Westmount, and myself at a rally this Sunday in North Sydney at 2 o'clock. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the member's recognition and acknowledgement of the investments being made in Cape Breton uh, for the health care services. Mr. Speaker, what I assure that member and all members of uh, Cape Breton and across the province uh, is that uh, we do take uh, the care of uh, Nova Scotians, the health care uh, needs, uh, very seriously. That's why we uh, look for opportunities to invest. And Mr. Speaker, we're looking forward. We're looking at the health care needs in these communities, not just for today, but into the future. We're investing for the future of the health care of these uh, communities, Mr. Speaker, providing those needs that will be met because for far too long, political parties of all stripes have ignored the needs and the recommendations to deliver the health care that they deserve. The Honourable Member for Sydney River Myra Lewisburg. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. If anybody has ignored the needs of the people of this province, it's that health minister that's over there. 130 plus people plus doctors are needed and yet he's signing up and talking about all the doctors they've already recruited. What about all the doctors that are left? What about the 100,000 Nova Scotians that don't have a family doctor, Mr. Speaker? What about them? This minister can come to Cape Breton and tell the people what his plan is, how it's working, and how famous and great he is for what he's not doing for them. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the member would uh, know that uh, as of September, over 8,000 Nova Scotians from the Eastern Zone have uh, now have uh, primary care access. They're attached to a family physician or primary care practice. That's 8,000 more people, Mr. Speaker, that have uh, family care than, uh, than previously did. These people, Mr. Speaker, appreciate the investments we've been making. They appreciate the recruitment efforts by the Nova Scotia Health Authority. Order, please. The Honourable Minister of Health. And Mr. Speaker, Cape Bretoners and all Nova Scotians appreciate the investments we're making in our programs, mental health services, Mr. Speaker. They'll appreciate the investments in our infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. And as I know, Mr. Speaker, the, the recruitment initiatives uh, when uh, primary health care providers have access to the new infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, we know, we've heard from the front line that this will be helpful in recruiting and retaining other health care professionals as well. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'll switch over to the Minister of Education, where I know I'm probably going to get a great answer. My question is for the Minister of Education and Early Childhood Development. 
I've asked about the Eccles Wedgeport a number of times. Eccles Wedgeport, of course, is a school of about 100 students in a small Francophone community in my constituency. Uh, the community, of course, is very pleased a new school has been announced to replace the current one. So I was wondering if the minister uh, could uh, give us a little update on where it sits in the construction process. The Honourable Minister of Education. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. In the first ever multi-year capital uh, plan that the province has engaged with. Um, uh, Wedgeport is uh, is on that. We're very happy for that. I know in our community of Yarmouth, and I know that the, in the members' community, people are very excited about this. Uh, we're on schedule to have construction uh, begin in uh, 1920 with school opening in 2021. Uh, as we enter into this year, the site selection process will begin, and uh, the community will be directly involved um, in that process and have a chance to express their opinions on best sites possible. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Argyle Barrington. Thank you very much. And, uh, you know, the community is chomping at the bit. They really want to get to uh, discussing this to find out what's going to be included and not included in their new school. Uh, and there's a number of interested community members that would uh, sit on a I guess we used to call them school construction committees, but I know we're not necessarily doing that anymore. So maybe the minister could give us an idea of where that process is and how confident he is that it's going to meet the 2019-2020 construction start date as outlined in the capital plan. The Honourable Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We have had a site selection pro process that has created a uh, uh, delays of up to three years, so we do have some work to do in terms of improving that uh, that process uh, because we want these schools to be built on time, uh, unlike past projects that weren't uh, weren't delivered on time to these communities. So we're in the process of finalizing what that's going to look like now, um, and uh, the community will be involved uh, once we get going with that. But uh, right now, we think we have a five-year capital plan uh, with a uh, with 13 schools on there, and we feel very positive about meeting the. Uh, the start and deadlines for each one of those. And I know this is going to be very exciting and important to all the communities that will be impacted. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Energy and Mines. On Tuesday, I asked the Minister of Environment how her department will make sure that Nova Scotia Power is not responsible for another spill like the one in Tufts Cove. She responded that her department leaves that up to the company and only steps in after a spill occurs. This is not a very strong regulatory standard and it's not reassuring. But if the Department of Environment feels it has no responsibility to prevent further spills, and I'd like to ask the Minister of Energy, is his department or any branch of government doing anything to make sure that Nova Scotia Power does not leak thousands of litres of oil into the harbour again. The Honourable Minister of Energy and Mines. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member for the question. We do keep a very co close relationship with uh, Nova Scotia Power and uh, uh, other partners uh, in the energy sector. Uh, specific to this situation, uh, we were well aware. Uh, Nova Scotia Power informed us immediately. Uh, they're taking all the necessary steps. Uh, as per the Department of Environment, I'm expecting an update uh, from them later today. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Mr. Speaker, I also asked the Minister of Environment if she could provide further information on why the oil uh, cleanup is going slower than expected. She could not. I asked the Minister of Environment if she could give us a new timeline for when she expects the cleanup to be complete, and she could not. The department seems to be leaving everything to Nova Scotia Power. Maybe we'll hear something more this afternoon. So I'd like to ask the Minister of Energy and Mines, can he or anyone in the government update us on why the cleanup is going slowly and when it will be complete? The Honourable Minister of Mines and Energy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, so uh, this uh, this situation, of course, uh, the Department of the Environment is the lead, but uh, from the beginning, uh, Nova Scotia Power has been very forthright with information uh, to my department. Uh, we've worked very closely uh, with the uh, Department of Environment, and there are a number of steps that Nova Scotia Power uh, needs to take in this situation to ensure that the cleanup is done. Uh, as I've said, they've been very forthright with information, and we're expecting an update on that cleanup later today. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of EMO. In a safety or medical emergency, Nova Scotians have been trained to call 911, and we are very lucky to have this service in Nova Scotia. But what happens when there isn't help on the other end of the line? For significant portions of Pictou West, the constituency that I represent, when people use their cell phones to call 911, the call is actually bounced to operators in PEI. I'm sure everyone can see where there's unintended consequences that can result. 
Is the minister um, aware of this problem, and does he know how many Nova Scotians may be affected? Thank the you. Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, I have heard in the past that this has happened. I'm not sure how many people are affected by that bounce occurring uh, between towers, uh, but we'll certainly commit to looking at uh, how many that might be. Uh, but I've not been made aware of, uh, since I became minister, that there have been any problems uh, to date. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Well, I'm glad I'm able to address this today because in these situations, we all know minutes count, indeed actually seconds, and I saw that and witnessed it this summer. To have a call routed across the Northumberland Strait to people who can't help on the other end, and it creates us losing valuable time in order to save someone. Um, it takes long enough, as we know, for help to arrive in such areas as mine and rural areas, and um, I'd like to know if the minister um, plans to create a plan to fix this gap in the 911 system and if the minister can tell the house how long it will be until all 911 calls in Nova Scotia are answered actually in Nova Scotia. The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, having worked previously in the EMS uh, world, I know what that feels like to be uh, responding and to take those calls, uh, having worked in the centre where that happens. I do know the good folks at 911 are working hard. They bounce those calls quickly. Uh, but again, uh, to the point of the, minister, the member's question, we're certainly committed to uh, look at this issue and around time frames. Uh, I'll let her know as soon as I possibly can, as well as all members in this House, uh, what the end result of that uh, review might be. And uh, we'll certainly uh, commit uh, today and forward to uh, having a look at that as soon as we possibly can. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Health. So many times we sit here and go around and around and around with never an end in sight to an answer. The people in Cape Breton are desperate. I will say I can't implore upon the, the Minister enough. And regardless of what we're being told about how wonderful things are over the sunny bridge, people in Cape Breton need to hear that directly. I am implore upon you the importance of your attendance at this meeting, and another one will be coming up. I will ask the minister again. The, min the meeting is Sunday in the north side. Will the minister attend this meeting as, Alf as my colleagues on the PC side? Please, just yes or no. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As the member knows, uh, the Premier and I, as well as my colleagues uh, from Cape Breton, were in Cape Breton in June. We explained to the representatives there what was going to be taking place, Mr. Speaker. That includes investments Order, please. in. Time allotted for oral questions put by members. The ministers has expired. We will now move on to government business. The Honourable Government House Leader. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call public bills for second reading? So now call public bills for second reading. Would you please call bill number 38, the Residential Tenancies Act? So now call bill number 38, the Residential Tenancies Act. The Honourable Minister of Service, Nova Scotia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that bill number 38, an act to amend chapter 401 of the revised statutes, the Residential Tenancies Act, be read for a second time. We know that many Nova Scotians are renters and landlords. In fact, there are over 300,000 Nova Scotians living in over 110,000 rental properties. Therefore, it is essential that landlords and tenants have easy to use modern processes that balance their rights and obligations to each other and are free of unnecessary red tape. Our goal is to make the act more inclusive, accessible and balanced for tenants and landlords. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased that with the amendments we are bringing forward here today. They are largely based on consultations with both tenants and landlord groups, Mr. Speaker. The value of these consultations brought to the table was incredible. We were able to gain insight from those who adhere to the Act, and their feedback helped inform our changes. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank our key stakeholders for their contributions to the consultations, and also staff for their hard work in bringing these changes to light. One of the most prominent issues that emerged during consultation was the need for clear information and common understanding of the Act. Mr. Speaker, landlords and tenants deserve to have access to clear, easy-to-use, modern processes. Clarifying terms such as tenant, 
and providing additional methods to serve documents, such as electronically, will help achieve those goals. In addition, the following amendments will improve clarity and consistency in the Act and increase efficiency and balance for all parties involved. Currently, landlords must inventory and store abandoned property for 60 days. The time frame will now be reduced to 30 days. Currently, home buyers who do not wish to be landlords may only make application to evict the tenant after a home is purchased and in their possession. This change will allow the seller to initiate the eviction upon proof of sale. Allowing tenants to give notice to change their yearly tenancy to month to month instead of asking for a, a landlord's permission. Providing landlords with entry times to show an apartment to a prospective tenant or purchaser where there is a fixed term lease in place. Terminating a lease the next month after a single tenant dies to eliminate unnecessary financial hardship for the family of the deceased. Currently, a family of, the, of a deceased tenant must give one month's formal notice to the end of the tenancy and pay the rent, and could be responsible for up to two months' rent, two months rent depending on when the notice is given. We find this very difficult and unfair, Mr. Speaker. While we are pleased with these amendments, we do appreciate there is more work to be done, and we'll continue to work with these groups on other opportunities for that very important improvement. Mr. Speaker, we recently introduced telephone hearings to the residential tenancy dispute resolution process to reduce wait, to reduce waste time, wait times for tenants and landlords, increase accessibility for clients, and make the process faster, more efficient, and cost-effective for all involved. Mr. Speaker, this means that tenants and landlords will no longer have to travel to an access center to participate in an in-person hearing. Tenants that live out of province can now participate in hearings from afar. Telephone hearings will be a better use of participants' time. This is just another step we are taking to enhance services for tenants and landlords and make our processes more convenient and balanced. Mr. Speaker, I am proud of the direction we are taking with these amendments here today. The team at Service Nova Scotia is continuously working to cut red tape for businesses and for citizens, modernize legislation, and make government services more accessible and efficient for Nova Scotians. These changes support that valuable work. Mr. Speaker, I conclude my, marks, my remarks now and look forward to the comments from my colleagues opposite. The Honourable Member for Inverness. Mr. Speaker, the, the Residential Tenancies Act is such an important piece of legislation. Think of the number of people in the province that it affects, thousands of people. Um, if it's good legislation, it helps to ensure people uh, have the opportunity to uh, rent the type of uh, accommodations they want, um, and if it's, it's, but it's always going to be about a balance of power between the tenant and the landlord. And um, I think it's, um, it's important that in that balance of powers, uh, at the end of the day, uh, everyone is served fairly and uh, in, in the best interest of what we can believe to be true, Mr. Speaker. And I think, about, um, I think about some changes made in the not-so-recent past uh, where landlords felt uh, that the type of risk they might be taking on in some cases was no longer worth it to them, Mr. Speaker. And of course, in such a scenario, then you will see uh, the actual reduction of properties available for rent. So uh, we don't want to see that, Mr. Speaker. Um, there are quite a number of changes in this bill. We do look forward to hearing from uh, tenant uh, representatives and from uh, landlords about their thoughts on it. Um, I've looked at, at a number of the items in here, Mr. Speaker, and I think they are good measures. Um, I, I think about uh, a couple just to mention would be the, uh, you know, when people have a property and they're renting it and for some reason they're choosing to sell the asset, um, currently there's a lot of... Um, Currently, if you wish to sell your property and it's being rented, you are restricted uh, by the wishes of the tenant. And Mr. Speaker, that is an awful lot to ask of somebody who's made an investment in a property, uh, perhaps tying up a significant amount of their personal capital, um, and they want to move on and perhaps do something else with uh, those funds. Uh, Mr. Speaker, to, for them to be restricted as they are now, I don't think that's fair. And I also don't think it's in the best interest of renters either, because if there's these kinds of restrictions, 
it will discourage people from renting properties. The fewer properties, the higher the price for rent, especially in urban, dense urban areas. Uh, but also in rural areas too. I think of uh, the community of Inverness. Uh, significant change the last number of years with the construction of the golf courses. Real estate has become a, uh, at a premium price. Uh, also, the, the advent of Airbnb, we have many people instead of choosing to rent uh, to local residents, they wish to rent uh, to people who are visiting the area uh, for more money. So, Mr. Speaker, um, it's important to achieve the right balance, and uh, I'm looking forward to listening to the Law Amendments Committee hearings and to see what uh, people have to say, but I do think there's some good measures in this bill. Thank you. The Honourable House Leader for the New Democratic Party. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I know uh, many Nova Scotians are impacted by a uh, Residential Tenancy Act, and I know uh, as an MLA, and I'm sure uh, members across uh, across the floor and other caucuses here often from constituents uh, with issues around residential tenancy, uh, often it's usually the tenant themselves. Uh, but over the years, uh, definitely have heard from uh, those who own uh, own. Uh, uh, rental properties, Mr. Speaker, uh, but for the most part, uh, most of the issues that I have had to deal with over the years uh, are, are geared towards the renters uh, and those who are renting, uh, uh, renting uh, spaces, Mr. Speaker. It is important, uh, I think, that government continue to modernize uh, and uh, the residential tenancy and continue to look at how do we improve uh, the situation for both the renters and those who, who own the properties, uh, but more importantly, to address some of the issues we see we see currently in uh, in the, the rental market here in Nova Scotia. And my colleague mentioned, you know, we're seeing jurisdictions now where it's very expensive and the selection is being limited uh, for uh, those local residents who want to rent, for example. Many seniors who decide that they want to uh, downsize and, and get rid of the, their ownership of a home uh, look towards the rental market, and, and it's going to be a challenge into the future. Airbnb has really, uh, I think, uh, uh, put another layer of, of concern on local residents who want to rent. Uh, we see demonstrations around the globe in major cities uh, that it's very hard for local residents to find rental properties because uh, there is more money in the uh, vacation kind of sector, Airbnb sector, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased the government uh, seems to have done some uh, consultation with stakeholders in developing this bill, and, and we do as a caucus look forward to hearing uh, from those who may want to come to law amendments to voice their concerns, either supporting this uh, or, or, uh, or the concerns with the bill. So we look forward to it going through the process, uh, Mr. Speaker. Trying to recognize the Honourable Minister of Service, Nova Scotia, will be to close second reading on Bill Number 38, the Residential Tenancies Act. The Honourable Minister of Service, Nova Scotia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, very briefly, I do uh, truly appreciate the comments from the members opposite Inverness and Sackville Cobbock with the NDP House Leader. Um, I, I certainly am. I feel uh, very much the same way with respect to law amendments uh, who come on behalf of the tenants and the landlords. Uh, I think it'll be much of the same group. Uh, there's been, there were six. Uh, representatives, IPONS, uh, Legal Information Society of Nova Scotia, DAL Legal Aid, Nova Scotia Legal Aid, Legal Aid, ACORN, and the Manufacturing Housing Association of Atlantic Canada. Stakeholders, I think there was about 20, 26 attendees, uh, so both sides. There was um, identified about 14 issues, uh, nine were agreed upon uh, on both sides uh, very much equally. Uh, there's two that we've advanced here that were a compromise um, that I think uh, both sides that will be uh, okay with, and three more that we'll bring back uh, that just need more work and homework and, and diligence uh, on behalf of Service Nova Scotia, and uh, we'll get those ready. It's going to be a continuous continuing dialogue. Uh, there's always more work to do, uh, as we say, but uh, this is certainly a good start. Uh, so I do appreciate those comments, and with that, uh, I move uh, the closing for second reading on this bill. Thanks. Motion is for second reading of bill number 38, the Residential Tenancies Act. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. Aye. Contrary-minded, nay. The motion is carried. Bill number 38, an act to amend Chapter 401 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Residential Tenancies Act. Ordered that this bill be referred to the Committee on Law Amendments. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call Bill number 42, the Vital Statistics Act. 
We'll now call Bill Number 42, the Vital Statistics Act. The Honourable Minister of Service, Nova Scotia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that Bill Number 42, an act to amend the Vital Statistics Act, be now read a second time. Last week, our Justice Minister introduced the Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity Protection Act. At the time of the introduction, he said a person's sexual orientation is to be respected, especially in a province that is proud to be diverse and inclusive. And Mr. Speaker, I couldn't agree more, and I know that all members of this House agree as well. Staff from Vital Statistics have been aware of some challenges facing the 2SL GBTQIA community regarding gender identity on the birth certificate. In-person and online consultations were held over the summer to learn more. It is all part of our work to modernize the Vital Statistics Act. Some of the groups consulted were the Nova Scotia Rainbow Action Project, Cape Breton Youth Project, Pride Nova Scotia, Pride Nova Scotia Government Employee Network, Halifax Pride, as well as many other 2SLGBTQIA plus organizations and groups. I am very grateful for their time, input, guidance, and in many instances, sharing their personal stories. Mr. Speaker, the consultations told us some people who identify as non-binary feel their gender would be better represented on the birth certificate by having the option to select an X as a gender marker in the sex field indicator. They feel the male or female binary on a birth certificate, birth certificate does not and cannot accurately reflect their gender. This is a step that has already been taken by many other jurisdictions, including the federal government, who now uses an X on the passport. The consultations also told us that the requirement to have a letter of support from a healthcare professional to change their sex indicator with vital statistics is overly burdensome, expensive, and uncomfortable, and treats their gender identity as an illness. In response to these concerns, we are introducing the following amendments to the Vital Statistics Act. X is being added as an option for gender identity in the sex indicator field on the Nova Scotia birth certificate for anyone who doesn't identify exclu exclusively as male or female. There will still be an option for male and female on the certificate. There will also be an option to obtain a birth certificate that does not display the sex field or indicator. I am also pleased to announce the fee to change the sex indicator on a birth certificate will be waived at the same time these changes come in effect. In addition, we are removing the requirement for anyone 16 years of age or older to get a statement from a professional to change their sex indicator on their birth certificate. And we are providing Nova Scotia residents born outside the province to apply for a change of sex indicator. This is an important step as in many cases it may be unsafe or not possible for them to contact their country of birth to obtain documentation that reflects their updated sex indicator or gender identity. Mr. Speaker, I'm very proud to say Nova Scotia is the first province in Canada to offer all of these services together. It is a tremendous accomplishment and one that I am so pleased to say has been receiving tremendous support and is very widespread and positive. Mr. Speaker, since our announcement yesterday, there has been an incredible amount of activity on social media. We've received support from Jessica Durling, the Canadian Bar Association, Nova Scotia Chapter, Chair of Halifax Pride, the Youth Project, Halifax Pride, and Nova Scotia Human Rights. Shea Morse, a non-binary teacher and community advocate, was very kind to lend their support to our announcement yesterday. Shea said the proposed changes take many important steps toward meeting the needs of Nova Scotians who do not wish to be identified by sex. Providing Nova Scotians with additional options to identify themselves or their children removes a significant barrier for the facing the 2S LGBTQIA plus community. While there is work left to do to remove barriers for our community, Mr. Speaker, passage of this legislation will truly be worth celebrating. The positive feedback and supportive words certainly validate the amendments and are the right thing to do. Yesterday was an important day for Nova Scotia and what we stand for as a province. I want to take this opportunity to thank and acknowledge the passion and hard work of our Deputy Registrar of Vital Statistics, Krista Dewey, and her staff who were determined to see this day come. I also want to thank the Human Rights Commission who worked arm in arm with our Vital Statistics team. Their insight was invaluable. 
In addition to consulting with the 2SL GBTQIA plus community, staff have also been working closely with other government departments through a new committee called the Community of Practice on Identity. This brings together 11 provincial government departments and offices who are working together to look at matters dealing with identity that can affect more than one department and more than one program. Nova Scotians expect our government to collaborate and consult to ensure that, where possible, our practices in one department align with others. The community of practice creates the important opportunity to share information and discuss and prepare for changes with cross-government implications. Other amendments we are making to the Vital Statistics Act include giving all parents the same right to register the birth of their child with the surname of their choice. Currently, where the, only the mother is on the birth record, the mother may register the child with her current surname. Parents who are married or parents who are both acknowledged on the birth registration can give their child any surname they wish. We're also providing Nova Scotians with the most secure and cost-effective access to online birth marriage and death certificates by creating the ability to restrict third-party vendors from selling these services online. Mr. Speaker, I believe in what we are doing. I believe these amendments are the right step to take for our province. And with that, I look forward to the comments from my colleagues. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Oop, thank you, Mr. Speaker, uh, and uh, thank you uh, to the minister for introducing this very important piece of legislation. Um, I want to firstly ap applaud uh, the government and the minister and his department for the uh, lengthy consultation uh, that they did on this. I think it's really important that we listen to the people that this affects. These kinds of changes affect most, and uh, it sounds like you did. A they did a good job at that. So thank you very much for that. Um, I want to voice my support for these changes. Um, I really hope that this is the first step towards actually making uh, gender neutral IDs available and fully updating the legislation to reflect our modern understanding of sex and gender. It's a great step. Uh, I think there's more to be done and we can talk about that further later. Um, I also uh, you know, want to echo what the minister said about uh, people in the LGBTQ plus community face barriers that uh, those who are not in that community may not have any sense of and uh, barriers that we just can't imagine uh, exist for, for that community that, that don't for others. And so um, anything that removes barriers uh, to being able to live a full uh, life protected uh, fully um, are important, is important. So thank you for that. Um, the government has the ability to remove the barriers, fully remove the barriers that exist for people and to make the concrete changes that we need to make our communities safer and more accepting for every person. So uh, that's all I'll say for now, but I uh, look forward to hearing uh, further discussion at law amendments and in hopefully third reading. <laughs> thank you. I to recognize the Honourable Minister of Service, Nova Scotia, will be to close second reading of Bill No. 42, the Vital Statistics Act. The Honourable Minister of Service, Nova Scotia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member opposite for her, her comments. Uh, obviously, we're in lockstep in terms of uh, what this means today. Always more work to be done, and uh, the, the law amendments process and the opportunity for Nova Scotians to come and, and share their, their opinions and perspectives and support uh, or uh, request changes on this uh, is, is always critical, so I look forward to that as well. Uh, but uh, quite frankly, uh, this is a pretty, uh, pretty proud day for, for myself uh, being part of this. This is one of those things that uh, only affects certain people, but it's just the right thing to do, and it's the, the type of legislation, policy, and direction we should strive for uh, as legislators and as all Nova Scotians. So uh, it's a good thing. Uh, again, uh, these opportunities come once in a while to really affect uh, the, the lives and, and make uh, people feel uh, like they see themselves in this province. So um, I'm happy to be here. Again, I do thank the member opposite uh, for her comments, and we'll see what happens the next step of the way. Uh, but there's more work to be done, and, and we'll get there for sure. And with that, I'd like to close the debate on Bill 42. <laughs> The motion is for a second reading of Bill Number 42, the Vital Statistics Act. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary-minded, nay. The motion is carried.
Bill Number 42, an act to amend Chapter 494 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Vital Statistics Act. Ordered that this bill be referred to the Committee on Law Amendments. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call Bill Number 44, the Change of Name Act? Well, now call Bill Number 44, the Change of Name Act. The Honourable Minister of Service, Nova Scotia. Mr. Speaker, I move that Bill Number 44, an act to amend the Change of Name Act be now read a second time. The amendment we are making, making will reduce the residency period for a person not born in Nova Scotia to seek a legal change of name. We are going from one year currently to three months. This amendment will allow Nova Scotia to align with other jurisdictions. And Mr. Speaker, because a change of name sometimes accompanies or follows the change of sex indicator, it is important that the residency requirements for both applications are aligned. This will make it easier for applicants who seek both changes as well for those just seeking a legal change of name. Mr. Speaker, it is, an impor it is important the Change of Name Act support the current day society and provide comfort and convenience for all Nova Scotians. Thanks. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and um, uh, I just want to say that I uh, am happy with these changes. It makes sense that we're bringing these uh, two bills in at the same time uh, to align with each other. And yes, I think uh, uh, making the change from one year to three months, three months for a name change is an important uh, and uh, uh, again barrier removing step for many people. Thank you very much. Trying to recognize the Honourable Minister of Service, Nova Scotia, it will be to close second reading of Bill Number 44, the Change of Name Act. Would all those? Oh, the Honourable Minister of Service, Nova Scotia. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, I thank the member opposite for her comments and her for her, for her, her support on this. And again, we'll work through the law amendments process to see uh, what feedback we get from the public. And with that, I'd like to close uh, second reading on Bill Number 44. Motion is for second reading of Bill Number 44, the Change of Name Act. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary-minded, nay. Motion is carried. Bill Number 44, an act to amend Chapter 66 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Change of Name Act. Ordered that the bill be read a second time on a future day. The Honourable Minister of Service, Nova Scotia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that you do now leave the chair and the House resolve itself into a committee of the Hall House on Bills. House will now recess while it... Sorry about that, Bill Number 44. We will refer that committee, that bill, to the Committee on Law Amendments. It's becoming routine here. Such a busy day with the Honourable Minister of Service, Nova Scotia. The Honourable Government House Leader has requested that we revert into the Committee of the Whole House on Bills. The House will now recess for a few minutes while we resolve ourselves into the Committee.
Order. The Committee of the Whole House on Bills will come to order. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Madam Chair. Would you please call Bill No. 2, Develop Nova Scotia Act. I call Bill No. 2, Develop Nova Scotia Act. The Clerk. Madam Chair, Bill No. 2 was reported from the Committee on Law Amendments without amendments and contains 30 clauses. For the benefit of the Committee, I want to explain that as we consider this bill and any other bill that may be called at this meeting, we will consider, be considering the bill in the form containing the amended amendments already made by the Committee on Law Amendments. And there were, there were no amendments made. Okay. I recognize, is that a, I recognize the clerk. So, Madam Chair, Bill Number Two uh, was reported back from the Committee of Law Amendments without amendments and contains 30 clauses. So, ask if Clause One shall Clause One carry? Shall Clause Two to Seven carry? Clause Eight carry? I. <laughs> I recognize the member from Cape Breton, Richmond. <laughs> Thank you, Madame la Présidente. Uh, I would like to uh, offer an amendment here on the bill. I have uh, a couple of amendments put forward today. Um, overall, I want to thank the minister for putting forward this bill. Obviously, we do need um, we need to, do need a mechanism to be able to. Uh, Oh, I apologize. I apologize. I'm putting forth an amendment on Bill Number Two, Develop Nova Scotia Act. It's CW. If I could just see this, I'll take my glasses off. PC-1. Is that correct? CWHB PC-1. Yeah. Good. Okay. Clause first or talk? Talk. I'll keep talking. Okay. So it's important, uh, it's important, Madam Speaker, that uh, we do have a mechanism in place to be able to roll out the important uh, investment that's going to be made in broadband services across the province. Um, so it's uh, wonderful to see that uh, there's going to be a Crown Corporation in place. Well, it already officially is in place, um, and that there's going to be a mandate, obviously, rolling out broadband services, especially within rural Nova Scotia. However, my concern uh, when looking into uh, the board of directors specifically from what would have been the old Waterfront Development Corporation and now has moved into and has been rebranded uh, as Development Nova Scotia. My real concern, uh, Madam Speaker, is that the board of directors, which I know that we're adding or the act will, uh, the bill will look at putting in three new uh, positions on the board. However, the 10 positions that are currently there, unfortunately, are all, uh, save one, uh, people who are from HRM. Now, I don't doubt the uh, credentials of all these individuals and the good work, obviously, that they've done on behalf of this province. However, as I read this act, what I discern from it and what I've heard from the minister opposite is that this bill and this Crown Corporation is going to be responsible for the economic development within all of Nova Scotia. So when I hear all of Nova Scotia, I, it's a very big province. I'm from Cape Breton Island, and oftentimes I think we're left behind in many ways. I think sometimes people forget that when you cross the causeway, there's a whole other landmass uh, there with people on it that need uh, services and uh, deserve an input into provincial processes just like everybody else. But also, obviously, all of rural Nova Scotia all of rural, rural Nova Scotia needs uh, to be well represented. And so on this board of directors currently, as I see it, all being from uh, HRM, save the one person who is from Lunenburg, and not having any complete direction or clear direction on uh, the three new positions and where they are going to be coming from. My concern is that all of Nova Scotia is not being represented in this new provincial economic development corporation that we are instilling here. So we are putting a lot of money, you know, 
millions of dollars. It's a multi-million dollar project that we're rolling out for broadband service. Most of that money is going to be invested through this corporation, through the trust, into rural Nova Scotia. And there is not one person, not one person on the board of directors of this corporation for development Nova Scotia that in fact is from rural Nova Scotia. I don't understand, Madam Speaker, how on earth that People who are, and again, I'm sure their CVs are uh, in, you know, in, in good standing. I'm sure they have excellent qualifications. But I hear it again and again and again from constituents from Cape Breton Island, from rural Nova Scotia. They are tired of Halifax making decisions on their behalf. I do not think that Heligonians completely should be making decisions on where broadband services are going to be rolling out across rural Nova Scotia. Um, so my amendments that I would like to put forward, which I do believe would be reasonable in this circumstance um, and would add a whole other layer of accountability and openness to, uh, to this process. I do move. Okay, I do move that the Governor and Council in making appointments under subsection 1 shall ensure that the board is representative of the regions of the province. As well as page one, sub clauses eight two to six, renumber as three to seven, and change cross references accordingly, Madam Speaker. I so move. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you. Oh. Okay. Okay. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I just wanted to rise and say a few words in support of my colleague's amendment. Uh, I think we uh, are all eager to see internet uh, rolled out uh, effectively across this province. Um, if, if we had had our say, it, it probably would have been done a little bit differently, uh, a little bit more transparently and probably uh, with a little bit more community ownership, as we've discussed before in this chamber. Uh, nonetheless, um, we're getting ready to go. And uh, I had the privilege of having a great conversation with the folks at Develop Nova Scotia. Um, I know that they are working to expand the board. I know that they are looking for regional representation on that board. but. That's only as good as the people who are sitting in the chairs making the decisions now. That's the reason that we make laws, that we make regulations. Uh, and Madam Speaker, uh, I would echo my colleague's concern, and certainly we in the NDP caucus feel strongly that um, if we're going to spend this amount of money, uh, if we're going to provide these services, which are so badly needed, uh, we want those services to work, and we want those services to meet the specific needs of constituents in their communities across the province. We know those needs will be different. Um, in a in a time when we've seen regional representation shrink and disappear every time we're in this chamber. Uh, I think we'd really welcome the government's demonstration here that they're serious um, about solving these really important problems uh, for communities that have all kinds of impacts. Uh, they've demonstrated that with this financial commitment, but we'd love to see them back that up uh, with a commitment to adding regional representation on this board that is going to make the vital decisions about which projects get rolled out, how those projects get rolled out, who the providers are in each community, the people best positioned to advocate for that around a board table, uh, to discuss that in a fulsome way, to understand the details of that, are going to be representatives from those communities themselves. Uh, so with that, Madam Speaker, I take my seat. Just a reminder that while in committee, I'm Madam Chair. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Just a few quick comments uh, with respect to, to this amendment. Um, everyone's uh, eyes are wide open here in terms of uh, the, the branding issue or sort of the, the sentiment that the Waterfront Development Corporation, uh, as it existed before, uh, was, was a peninsula operation because it was. Uh, and with the, the addition of Lunenburg, therefore an addition of a Lunenburg board member, um, that's reflective of the two particular areas that this board was serving. 
but now this is a completely different game. And rather than, again, um, rather than for, uh, for us to have to build a corporation, a Crown Corporation from the ground up, which would take several months, uh, new hoops and, and uh, obstacles uh, that we would have to, be, to, have to deal with, uh, the whole idea, what we heard from stakeholders, municipalities, everyone who had a vested interest in this said, get this money out the door and get it spent and, and get us internet access. So in the, in the reason, with the reason of um, getting this done quickly, and with competent people around the table, Mr. S Madam Chair, uh, that was the, that's the focus here. Uh, Jennifer Angel and her team uh, and the board uh, at Develop Nova Scotia are, are incredibly talented people. They're committed to this. They have $193 million, an unprecedented amount uh, to spend to get uh, our rural communities broadband access. Uh, no one takes that lightly. Uh, there's no Halifax agenda. Uh, these people that are on the Develop Nova Scotia board, I know that the, the members opposite said good things about them. Uh, that's that's uh, very much deserved. They are good people and they're Nova Scotians. They, they understand the challenge here. They understand the, the perception that this is a downtown Halifax board as exists now. They don't, they're not focused on downtown Halifax. They're focused on getting broadband to the rural communities. So they'll do their part in their capacity as they sit now, uh, and they'll do a good job. So I've got full faith that they understand the challenge. Uh, they realize that this is about the entire province. Uh, it's, it's an issue that, that exists largely in rural Nova Scotia, uh, and they'll, they'll make sure that they, they take that with them to every conversation. That's both Jennifer and her staff and the board members. Further, uh, very clear in the legislation, as we discussed uh, in, in second reading and, uh, and uh, through the, the entire process, we have three new members and their whole focus is the regional representation. So um, this sort of criticism and the focus that we're not being accountable and open and, and inclusive, uh, I, I don't think is warranted in this particular case. We're adding members uh, with a rural uh, capacity. Obviously, those decisions aren't made. We don't know who those members will be yet, but the whole point is to get it uh, out to, into rural Nova Scotia and have representation that's reflective of the entire province. So um, that's where where we are at this point. Uh, I don't. Uh, I know that sometimes the, the 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 opposition have to highlight something. I I don't see this as a particular issue. There's no reason for this to focus and stay in downtown Halifax. That's never the intent. That's nobody's goal. Uh, and with three new members from outside of the of the peninsula, uh, this will be very reflective of Nova Scotia. So uh, I would like to uh, end with those comments. Thanks. Recognize the Honourable House Leader for the official opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And uh, you know, the, the the amendment, as you see before you, uh, really revolves around the future of the board. You know, as those members uh, retire or their terms come to an end and they do not want to reoffer, we just want to make sure that. Uh, there is that full representative across the province. Now, the minister did talk about three representatives uh, from across the province, uh, which concerns me just a little bit, uh, because where is the member going to be from South Shore? Are they going to be from the Valley? Are they from Western Nova Scotia? Are they from Cape Breton? Which part of Cape Breton? Are they from Northern Nova Scotia, Cumberland County, Pictou counties? So there's a lot of different areas that I think government tends to sort of squash together and you know, I don't think it does does them any 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 good to to see the com competition that's actually happening across this province. We have a large, uh, great, vibrant, independent province, and we want to have people that are representative of our areas. Uh, you know, when I see one person representing all of uh, southwestern Nova Scotia, and that includes from your constituency, Madam Chair, uh, right around to I think uh, the member for Kings North. You know. That's, that's not enough representation for, uh, you know, either the health board, which I think there's only the one. Uh, it's really not enough because, like I said, the issues that happen in, in Lunenburg versus what happened in Yarmouth, which happened in Kings North, are, are, are very different in nature. The communities are different. The opportunities are different. Uh, so as these people re retire or their terms come to an end, uh, we want to have a commitment. Uh, legislation is always the best way for these kind of commitments to be solidified, uh, but also, you know, I'm hoping that we hear again from the, from the minister uh, that uh, he, can, he can assure us uh, that there will be that broader representation as we do spend these tens of millions of dollars uh, that will, of course, benefit uh, those communities in rural Nova Scotia, I think, much more than they would here in, uh, in Metro Halifax. So thank you for the opportunity to speak. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and, and to the uh, Honourable House Leader for the opposition. I, I assure him, I promise him, he, 
the, the opposition, the opposition side of the House does not have a monopoly on common sense, Madam Chair. I promise him that. I promise you. When three, three, three representatives that are going to be added immediately to ref reflect the regional re realities of a broadband initiative, when members retire, when members move and the composition of developed Nova Scotia changes, of course, Madam Chair, the, 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 the goal and the act is going to be that they're going to add regional representation and further increase that ability for the board to reflect all of Nova Scotia. It'll continue down that road. This is just common sense. Jennifer, the chair, the board members, they get this, Madam Chair. And, and quite frankly, if this is the biggest challenge with, with this developed Nova Scotia legislation, I think we've done pretty well. Thanks. Does the amendment carry? Ex order. Does the amendment carry? The amendment. The amendment is de order. Order. I'll do it again. Order. Does the amendment carry? No. The amendment is not is defeated. Does clause eight carry? Do clauses, shall clauses 9 through 26 carry? carry. Shall clause 27 carry? carry. Oh my God. I recognize the honourable member for Cape Breton, Richmond. Deep breath, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I would like to propose another set of amendments uh, from uh, CWHB PC-1, uh, Develop Nova Scotia Act, it's page 5, subclause 27, 1, line 1, add. And within nine months of the coming into force of this section, after minister, the first time it appears, and on page five, clause 27, add after subclause 27.4, five, the corporation shall evaluate a five-year strategic plan submitted under subsection one each year and make the results of the evaluations available to the public. Madam Chair, I would like to put forward these amendments, and again, it's not that I'm just uh, here to try and give the minister a hard time, and overall, I truly do think that, you know, this is a bill that is needed. Um, I, I, I'm just doing my job as the opposition member. I've gone through the bill. Line by line, with a fine-tooth comb, I've asked for input from my caucus colleagues. I've asked for input from people that I know from the economic development field, because I used to work in it myself. And there was a time as well, ma Madam Chair, that I used to do strategic planning for a living. And so what I learned from strategic planning is that a strategic plan is a living document. And in this uh, bill, I do not see one that we have a, uh, a date where we need, where the corporation needs to be able to um, align to a date where they're going to, in fact, give us a strategic plan. So there's no date for the strap plan to be done. And at the moment, they only have to do an evaluation and report on that strategic plan, with again has an amorphous date, uh, every five years. You don't do an evaluation from my experience or any experience that a strategic planner, I think, would, uh, would explain to this house every five years. You need to do an evaluation on a strategic plan every year, Madam Chair. It's vitally important that you know when you have a project of this magnitude and the several different projects that will be under the umbrella of Develop Nova Scotia, not just internet service, we need to know, the public needs to know that 
that's uh, developed Nova Scotia, especially with the broadband service project, are going to be on target, they're going to stay on task, they're going to be meeting their objectives. That's the whole point of a strategic plan, Madam Chair. So I would like uh, to put forward these uh, amendments, which again, I don't believe um, in, in any way uh, that we as uh, the opposition members have a monopoly on any kind of common sense as the uh, minister opposite has uh, has stated um, and to be quite honest with you madam chair i take offense to that statement yeah. i'm doing my job exactly. i'm doing my job madam chair so with that i with that, I would like to so move that these amendments um, are, are considered. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I do thank the member opposite, and I, and I appreciate that. Um, some of these things uh, for, for us have been uh, fully developed and established over the course of time when you're when you're. Uh, a department and a, and a Crown Corporation that's pioneering a, a new direction in a broadband program to the tune of $193 million. Um, you've got to be very diligent and, and very specific and, and measured in terms of, of uh, what decisions you make and how you structure this. And uh, again, I, I appreciate that, that the member um, about my comments about the, the monopoly on common sense. And I'm also doing my job as well, and I feel like we've done a very good job structuring this. Uh, this is a very important program and, and a very important initiative for Nova Scotians, and I think that uh, we have done an incredibly good job in structuring it so that, number one, uh, it, it hits the mandate of getting 95% of Nova Scotians broad, broadband internet access. Uh, number two, it's open. Number three, it's accountable. Uh, number three, it will be very much measured by, by the way uh, that other Crown Corporations are vis-a-vis -vis annual, annual plans and reporting. So um, we're comfortable with the strategic plan as identified uh, because it's the long-term uh, template uh, for how we're going to spend this money. Again, uh, looking at the Bright Star reports on the middle and last mile, um, there, there's very much uh, references, the timelines in terms of the, the staggering amount of investment that's required here, up to $500 million to, to get this done for Nova Scotia. Uh, there is a, a broad horizon in terms of uh, having this develop Nova Scotia broadband program in place. So um, it uh, certainly will have uh, annual checks and, and reporting. Uh, and again, all of the spending, as I had said uh, in second reading, through the, through the uh, Internet Trust and with Develop Nova Scotia's reporting process, this will very much be open, very much accountable, and uh, we're comfortable with what's in place as is. Thanks. Does the amendment, does the amendment carry? The amendment is defeated. Does Clause 27 carry? Yeah. Shall Clauses 28 through 30 carry? Yeah. Shall the remaining clauses carry? Yeah. Shall the title carry? Yeah. Shall the bill carry? Yeah. The bill is carried. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Madam Chair. Would you please call Bill Number 4, the Corporations Registration Act? I call Bill Number 4, the Corporations Registration Act. The Clerk. Madam Chair, Bill Number 4 was reported back from the Committee on Law Amendments without amendments and contains two clauses. Shall Clause 1 carry? carry. Shall the remaining clauses carry? carry? Shall the title carry? carry. Shall the bill carry? carry? The bill is carried.
I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Madam Chair. Would you please call Bill Number 10, the Liquor Control Act? I call Bill Number 10, the Liquor Control Act. The Clerk. Madam Chair, Bill Number 10 was referred back to the Committee from the Committee on Law Amendments without amendments and contains three clauses. Shall Clause 1 carry? Shall the remaining clauses carry? Shall the title carry? The, shall the bill carry? Carried. The bill is carried. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Madam Chair. Would you please call Bill Number 13, the Daycare Act? I call Bill Number 13, the Daycare Act. The Clerk. Madam Chair, Bill Number 13 was referred from the Committee on Law Amendments without amendments and contains 26 clauses. Shall Clause 1 carry? Shall the remaining clauses carry? Shall the title carry? Shall the bill carry? The bill is carried. <clears throat> so we have stopped. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Madam Chair. Would you please call Bill Number 16, Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity Protection Act? I call Bill Number 16, the Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity Protection Act. Shall clause the clerk. Madam Chair, Bill Number 16 was referred from the Committee on Law Amendments without amendments and contains nine clauses. Shall Clause 1 carry? I recognize the Honourable Member from Dartmouth North. For Dartmouth North. Thank you, Dartmouth North. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to uh, talk about the context for this bill today. Um, it's a bill that uh, to address an issue that all three political parties in this House uh, believe uh, is important and are unified mostly in our thinking about. All three parties have drafted versions of the bill in attempts to address the serious harm that we know can result from sexual orientation or gender identity change efforts. All three versions of the bill are imperfect, as most bills are, but I'm encouraged that we may have an opportunity to work together today on making the best bill possible. The goal, as is stated in the title of the, of the bill, is a society that respects and protects the sexual orientation and gender identity of all citizens. That no person of any age in any community in our province be subjected to a practice that doesn't work, causes harm, reinforces to intolerant, discriminatory, homophobic and transphobic attitudes and ideas. So today we have an opportunity as legislators to, legislators to say loud and clear that we do respect sexual orientation and gender identity of all individuals and that we will protect their right to healthy lives free of discrimination. And I hope we are able to stand together to do just that. Thank you. Shall, shall clause one carry? carry? Shall clauses two through five carry? carry. Shall clause six carry? I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hello again. Uh, <laughs> as I stated earlier, I believe this bill is somewhat imperfect, uh, but I believe we have a shared interest in getting it right. 
Um, I would like to draw your attention to uh, CWHB NDP 1, page 2, clause 6, uh, A, subclause 2. I'm, I'm going to read the amendment. So A, subclause 2, delete, and B, subclause 3, re renumber as 2. So, as I said before, we've all articulated a shared understanding that these change efforts uh, that we're talking about are not a therapeutic intervention. Uh, they offer no benefit to anyone and, in fact, are likely to cause harm in individuals. The bill, as presented, clearly excludes such activities from health-related spending and from the scope of practice of regulated health professionals, which it should, as it should. And I think all three uh, parties' bills uh, made that very clear. Therefore, in no way should the legislation then treat these prohibited practices in a way that mirrors our treatment of health-related practices or decision-making. So when we talked about the bill in, first, in second reading, uh, the minister uh, made reference to the reasoning behind the inclusion of that clause, uh, 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 clause six, um, talking about the precedent uh, for um, allowing mature minors to consent to health-related uh, treatments. However, in another part of the debate, the minister uh, talked about how and, and re referenced this other clause that that we should be removing um, all um, all reference to uh, this treatment, quote-unquote treatment, from being a medical treatment. Um, so I think that's a really important, uh, really important uh, argument to remember, that because this is not a health-related treatment, then the uh, reference to, change it to ensuring that mature minors have consent to a health-related treatment doesn't really need to be there. So I would, I would like to state that first and then further my argument and say that we know that when... Uh, transgender or, or gay youth uh, are not met with, uh, with, with uh, a welcoming, um, when they, when they uh, um, express their sexual identity or, gender or uh, sexual orientation or gender uh, identity and they're not met with welcome and, uh, and open arms from whoever they uh, come out to, then they begin to internalize uh, homophobia and transphobia. They could have been internalizing that for many, many years. And so many of these young people are traumatized by the transphobia and homophobia that they've been experiencing. <sighs> Sorry. And so really they are, they, I would suggest that they are not in a position to consent to any kind of treatment for, the, for that, uh, for, uh, their sexual orientation or gender identity. We need to protect all individuals, regardless of age, from this seriously harmful practice. It does not matter how old someone is. We have to stop this practice from happening. We have to protect people from it happening. And I really, really urge uh, the government to, to hear this from the people who have spoken at law amendments, from people who have reached out to us, and hear that it doesn't matter how old someone is, that we have to stop this practice. So please, I urge you to support this amendment. Thank you. Does the amendment carry? The amendment is defeated. Does Clause 6 carry? Does Clause 7 carry? Yeah. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. <laughs> uh, I just want to uh, uh, propose another amendment on CWHB NDP 1, page 2, Clause 7, uh, A, subclause 2, delete, and B, subclause 3, renumber as 2. Thank you. Does the amendment carry? No. The amendment is defeated. Does Clause 7 carry? No. Shall Clause 8 carry? No. I recognize the Honourable Member for Picto West. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And if I can draw the member's attention to change sheet CWHBPC1. Basically, I just want to um, address that what's in this piece of legislation right now under Clause 8 is um, 
is well said, but it's not strong enough. So um, I think that ta accepting these amendments would uh, strengthen the wording for better clarity, and we want to ensure that the advances that society has made already are captured in this section, and we don't go backwards. And it's simply just strengthening the language, uh, per and I, I hope that this language presented in um, the, in my amendments would be more within the spirit of the bill and again just making sure that all the achievements that we've come together collectively um, you know don't result in unintended consequences so it's really about strengthening so page two clause eight a I would ask delete and at the end of paragraph a b delete paragraph b and substitute the following B, services designed to align a person's physical characteristics with the person's gender identity, including gender-affirming surgeries, hormone therapy, and related services, and C, services designed to legally recognize a person's gender identity, such as gender marker changes on identification documents. So I so move these amendments, Madam Chair. Does the amendment carry? No. The amendment is defeated. Does clause eight carry? No. Do the remaining clauses carry? No. Shall the title carry? No. Isn't someone speaking to that? No. The title is carried. Shall the bill carry? No. The bill is carried. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Madam Chair. Would you please call Bill Number 23, the Canadian Free Trade Agreement Implementation Act? I call Bill Number 23, the Canadian Free Trade Agreement Implementation Act. Shall cause one, the clerk. Madam Chair, Bill Number 23 was referred from the Committee on Law Amendments without amendments and contains 27 clauses. Shall clause one carry? Shall the remaining clauses carry? carry. Shall the title carry? carry? Shall the bill carry? carry? The bill is carried. <coughs> I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that you do now rise and report these bills. The motion is carried. The committee will now rise and report its business to the House. Order, please. The Chairman of the Committee of the Whole House on Bills will now report. That the Committee of the Whole has met and considered the following bills. Bills number, four, number 2, 4, 10, 13, 16, and 23. And the Chairman has been instructed to recommend these bills to the favourable consideration of the House. And these bills were uh, uh, considered without amendments, Mr. Speaker. Ordered that these bills be read a third time on a future day. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That concludes government's business for today.
I move that the House do now rise to meet again tomorrow, Friday, September 21st, between the hours of 9 a.m. and 1 p.m. Following the daily routine and question period, business will include second reading for public bills 39, 45, and 48, and with time permitting, private bills, private and local bills number 17. Motion is for adjournment for the House to rise to meet again tomorrow, September 21st, between the hours of 9 a.m. and 1 p.m. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. The House now stands adjourned until tomorrow at 9 a.m.